as our regular meeting, which we gabbled in earlier today, this morning, and then just had a great lunch with uh, some of the legislative leaders and the state board. We're going to go right to public participation because we have a few of those and we want to honor our folks. Um, and then we're going to introduce employees because they're here. And then we'll, we've got a special agenda adjustment that we're going to accommodate right after that. So why don't we start with public participation, Mertz. Okay, I, I currently have two forms. If there are any other people that have forms, I'd be interested in receiving them, please. Um, and these two people have requested to come to the board table together, although they will each be speaking for five minutes. So they are Nancy Fawner and Amy Colton. If you'd like to come to the board table, I will close up the computer so it's not in your way. You can give me those. The timer will, um, I'll do five minutes per person, as is the board's custom, and they do not engage in a conversation, but they're happy to hear whatever it is you have come to tell them. You ready? Yes, sir. Hey. <laughs> <coughs> and we're really going to tag team here, so. Um, well, um, State Superintendent Flanagan, members of the board, Mr. Whiston, and uh, stakeholders. I'm Amy Colton. I'm Executive Director of Learning Forward Michigan. It's the state affiliate of the international organization Learning Forward used to be the National Staff Development Council. Our mission is to build the capacity of leaders, both teachers and administrators, to be able to design and sustain effective professional learning. And I'm here with... I'm Nancy Fawner and I'm the Executive Director of Michigan ASCD. Michigan ASCD is an affiliate of the national office also, which is an international office too. Our mission is dedicated to excellence in learning, teaching, and leading, and we achieve that through our meaningful collaborations with others, supportive policies and practices, and products and services that help inform educational leaders. So we'd like to start by first commending the board. I know some of you were on the board back in January of 2012 for adopting the Michigan Professional Learning Policy and Standards. And by adopting those, we um, can see that the board really sees that in order to implement these new initiatives like uh, college and career ready standards, the new assessments, the teacher um, educator evaluations, is going to require a new kind of professional learning, which is what is described in the policy and the standards. And that this will require professional learning that drives teaching and leadership for improved instruction. Um, as active stakeholders, both our organizations were at the table for two years as this policy was being developed. And um, both our organizations are extremely committed to ensuring that every Michigan educator engages every day in effective professional learning so that every student will learn. Um, for those new to the board, um, we wanted to give you a brief um, overview of those standards because those standards actually are, that you adopted, <coughs> are internationally recognized. They were developed um, under the guidance of Learning Forward and involved professional organizations from across um, the country and happy to say that the Michigan Department of Ed was one of the stakeholders that helped develop them and they were being developed at the same time that we were working on the policy. Um, so does everybody have the quick reference because I'm going to walk you through this one. And, and the other thing that Learning Forward tells everybody and I think is important is that Michigan was one of, maybe the, might have been the first, if not the second, uh, State Board of Ed to adopt these standards in the country. So we're real proud of that as well. So what I'd like to do is just quickly walk you through both the standards and then the theory of change that actually drives the standards. And these standards were developed as a framework for how one would impl implement, evaluate, design, 
implement and evaluate professional learning. You'll see at the top on the inside there are seven standards. Each standard actually starts with professional learning that increases educator effectiveness and results for all students and then it tells you what those various characteristics need to be and all of these need to be implemented to get the intended results of a change in practice and student learning. If you look on the bottom right where you see all the circles, the, the theory underlying these standards is really important and is what we're um, really involved in, in helping people understand. So that if you look at circle one, when the professional learning standards are standards based, it has a great potential for changing educators' practice, knowledge, skills, and dispositions. That's if it's standards based. And when that happens, if you look at the third one, when teachers and administrators develop a deeper understanding and a, a skill set, they actually have more of a repertoire to be reflective in meeting the learning needs of both the educator and the student. And when that happens, there's more likelihood that the professional learning is contributing to student results. And this theory is actually also defines a continuous cycle of improvement that we want all educators to be engaged in. So our organizations have been working both independently using these standards and collaboratively using these standards and we thought we'd give you a little snapshot about that today. Michigan ASDD offers comprehensive professional learning to inform and support leaders from both the teacher leader level all the way to the superintendent level if the superintendent has responsibilities for curriculum instruction and assessment. And so one of the uh, professional learning opportunities that we offer is our two-year Curriculum Leaders Institute. And it has been designed and realigned using the professional learning standards. So we're holding ourselves accountable for professional learning that we're providing, that we're modeling this, of course. And then we explicitly teach the standards within that two-year program. So I think it's in the second session when we're working with uh, curriculum leaders and we're talking about good school improvement practices. We introduce the standards because your professional learning should also be uh, you know, aligned to what your data says but using good standards for professional learning. And the second year we're expecting out those curriculum leaders of ours to be actually implementing these in their own school settings and actually learning through the modeled process. So that's I think probably one of our strongest uses of them and so many of the professional learning standards appear in their two-year change initiative that they implement in their particular district as part of this comprehensive two-year program. But besides, there are additional professional learning offerings that we offer in curriculum assessment and instruction. We really try to model by creating professional learning communities that are ongoing professional learning opportunities so people just don't show up for an event and then they go home. We really try to incorporate adult learning theory and the way that we design these very purposefully. What is this particular group going to respond to? We try to collect data to determine the participant needs, that this is a need in the state, this is a need in the particular county, we're customizing it because of this population. And we gather feedback and how well those professional learning opportunities we have given them has begun to change teachers' practice or their beliefs in such a way that it's transferring to it being implemented in the classroom, which is beginning to impact student achievement. So we're taking them very seriously and we're seeing results in using them. Collectively, our organizations, besides what we have done independently, have presented uh, at three school improvement conferences over the last two years. And we've been talking about these particular standards, especially as they're applied to job embedded designs for professional learning. You always get that question, well, how do you make this work? within school settings? How do you make that work within a day's framework? And so for the last three um, school improvement conferences, we have focused on that. We've also provided an overview of the standards and the theory of action to the Michigan Association of Administrators of Special Education. And we followed up that day with a full session on job embedded professional learning upon request by their particular members. So those are a few things we've been doing collaboratively across our organizations. So in the two minutes that remain, we also wanted to share our most recent collaborative initiative that we're just getting off the ground and will start this June. We have um, 
found many people in the field who are asking about collaborative inquiry. And it, the research really shows that collaborative inquiry is one of the most impactful ways to do professional learning. And this dates back to work that the, on the Eisenhower grants. And so people are beginning to say they want to do that, they want to engage their educators in that. And what we're concerned about is that they won't be critical consumers, they'll just grab a model, and there are lots of models out there. So we've decided to um, create a design team of different organizations, including MDE, a member from MDE, to explore what, what collaborative inquiry is, what the different models are, so that they will not only know what the different models and purposes are, but then can also um, decide which one is most appropriate for their context. And this really builds on some work that Learning Forward uh, Michigan's been doing over the last few years, and that is we've been engaging people in year-long collaborative inquiry, but we've also developed a teacher leadership program that the principals also attend to learn how to facilitate job embedded collaborative inquiry in their schools. And as Nancy said, we're all seeing some incredible um, results. Teachers say that the cultures are shifting, that they see collective responsibility, that they feel empowered to guide their own professional learning instead of being told what they need, that they're really looking at immediate, immediate and relevant problems of practice so that they can address the needs that they have as well as the students on a regular basis. So we're um, looking forward to working with others to develop some programs around that for the state. Can I thank say, you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we just to say thank you. But I'm sorry. <laughs> We'll let you say thank you. Thank you. It's beyond the time. <laughs> we appreciate the opportunity to share this with you. Thank you. Thanks, Nance. Thank Thanks, you. Amy. Very good. You and your organizations just do exceptional work, Very and nice. it's unheralded. So thank you for bringing some of that thank to you. our attention again today. I'm going to do my report because I can see that David doesn't have some of his team here yet. And let me just do my report, sure. and then we'll. Whenever you need to start with us, you know, that's fine. But are some on their way? Are some on their way yeah. to join you? So let me just do mine, and then we can <coughs> accommodate your timing. I, a couple of things I wanted to say. You heard me. I, I'm repeating myself, but it's new audience today. I mean, we really are lucky to have Brian coming on board in, in July with his kind of fresh perspective on local district issues. And he's a good person, smart, brings a lot of experience. So that's a great thing. I will say the day he was appointed, the next day Anna came up to me in the first thing in the morning and she said, do you realize you were singing in the shower? <laughs> and, and I don't sing. And, and I thought she was kidding and she said, no, no, seriously. And I said, well, what was it? She said, I think it was the Who's I'm Free. You know, I was <laughs> Because I, I want to say this on behalf of Brian. I said, David knows, I said a little bit of this at the Ed Alliance yesterday, that when you're in the job, you can't whine. Uh, but it's the hardest job I've ever had, by far. And I think I'm trying to say this so that Brian gets a fair shake, that it takes, a, it takes some time for a while just to understand the issues and to, um, you know, he's had tremendous experience in the field. There's still, it's a different world, you know? And as some of you said at the luncheon today, the, there's a bunch of different folks involved. I mean, first and foremost is the state board. There's also a legislature and a governor. And then there's the field and the kind of things that they're actually dealing with. So it's very difficult. And I still haven't developed thick enough skin uh, because it's the nature of the job that you end up making decisions where often half the people are happy and half are not. So over time, um, I used to say you lose about 10% of the people a year, and then I figured, OK, I've been here 10 years, 10%. <laughs> so thanks to the two of you that are left, uh, but, I, but I really uh, respect Brian and think he's going to do a great job. I wanted to give you a brief update on MSTEP. Yesterday was the beginning of kind of our eight-week cycle. Um, I didn't know if we would be responding to a bunch of bad news stories today, and we're not. You know, things seem to be going really well. And this would have sounded a little defensive on our part, but we can only do so much. I mean, we're a local control state. So yesterday, I thought the Nest Center team uh, breakfast to kick this off because our team has worked so hard on this for quite a while. It's the first year of this I, I, and you know I think we should take a little credit as a team that we thought we need to get this out of the way before a new person's on board. This was back a couple of years ago 
knowing that you don't want in your first year to suddenly have to work out online testing, for example. We didn't know some of these other things would happen, such as not being able to continue with Smarter Balance. So obviously this team, I, I, I just owe the team downstairs in the second floor for the, to repeat again that their work to pull this off uh, after pretty much the rug was pulled out from under us uh, last year when we weren't able to continue with Smarter Balance as such. That's the other reason we decided not to have any um, labeling this year, because you had MEEP last year, MSTEP this year, and next year the, a new test, three different tests. Um, having said that, I, I have to kind of say I, it was curious to me that it cer in certain pockets there was so much concern about the testing because of all years, there's really no consequences for it, not to the degree that there have been some, some hype. So yesterday I go down to the breakfast, and the irony is by 8 o'clock, 1,000 students are already on the system. Um, I think one had completed midway through breakfast at 8.30. One kid had already <laughs> completed. At the end of the day yesterday, we had 29,000 completed test segments, probably updated to what? We have uh, the midday update just now was 111,000. 111,000. Completed 000. test segments. So it'd be like taking the ELA portion. We tested by midday today four times as many test sessions than we did all of yesterday. Just very little technical challenges. So it is going well. And the team does deserve a lot of credit. So. Team does, the team, the, the locals that have worked on this, I mean, I think it's really, it hopefully it continues to turn out over the next few weeks. But this is, uh, I mean, our folks, there's just no other way to say it. They work tirelessly on that. Um, this was something that we know is high stakes, obviously. And we know that even if a local district had some issues, it's probably going to be seen as the state issues. But we said, you know, let's just, we'll be big boys and girls about that and just just let it go if that happens. Um, I don't know if you've seen, I think we send this to you, and if we don't, we certainly will start. But this has just started, really, because a lot of the tension in the field on, uh, there's a special called Spotlight on Student Assessment and Accountability that comes out regularly from the department to the field. And I think it's gotten that in its hotline. I heard good feedback yesterday at the Ed Alliance about the hotline really working. Also good feedback, by the way, on a, told her this privately, but I can say this publicly on the kind of work that Vanessa has done with individuals and with boards out there to help them be a lot more comfortable about going into this testing season. And they just described her, one even used the word rock star. So I think that, that was quite an honor to hear that, especially from this person. We'll go on name now. I can't. <laughs> um, you know, the trig stuff that Kathleen brought up earlier today, uh, working the trig project with ISDs around the state, uh, to ensure that we have what we call tiger teams on the ground so that they can go out and help with hands-on technical assistance if districts or schools need help with their technology. This, probably some of that's already happened and will continue. I appreciate the ISD staff that are staffed pretty well stepping up on this also. Although there's been some angst and worry, a great deal of change, much of it, as you know, from outside of our control, this is really... I think an exciting opportunity, uh, transitioning to online assessment, it's a, it's a big and important step for our state. It's, we've worked on this four years. You know, it, it comes, its culmination is now, but it's a four-year effort to get to this point. And remember, as I said, we're not using the results of these tests for high-stakes purposes unless a school or district fails to meet the participation targets, and even then, the consequences are somewhat unclear in the, with the feds. But we hope, what, what we wouldn't want to be in a spot is is where we think we're doing the fair thing by not having consequences, but then creating tension with the federal department and, and Arnie and others that somehow we didn't in good faith take these tests. So that, that's the tension, a little bit of tension. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about testing time. I, I, I think we made it clear last month and we addressed this per Cassandra's point. I think we made it pretty clear that this is an unusual year because which law don't we follow? And next year it will go down because the college uh, uh, entrance exam aligns to the standards very well. So that time won't have to have other wraparound questions. It's, it's less than 1% of the instructional time. It's still important. I'm not minimizing it. But sometimes you read some of these articles and you would think it's something much more than that. And uh, that's just for context. 
I mean, we all know, we get it more than anyone. Assessment is not the end goal, but it is an important tool. And my daughter, a teacher, she, she went with me to uh, go to the MCAN conference on Sunday because she's a halftime counselor, as some of you know, and a halftime teacher. And, um, you know, they, they, assessment people understand is important to inform their instruction. So, I mean, a lot of this, I think we're, we're getting to a better place. And then I thought I would just end, just I'm trying to think of a more innovative way, especially whenever I turn this over to Melody, and who's so creative in the way she makes her presentation, and I'm just kind of verbally blah, blah, blah. So this is my best <laughs> attempt. It's not a lot. I mean, it's just, it, what I thought we'd do is just show, if you're not, if you're not following Twitter, it really is a pretty good way to communicate, and I use it pretty actively. These are just some examples this last month. And if anything, it highlights some of the things going on in our, in our districts and other places. Okay, some of you were there. That was okay. This was a sincere shout out for, for Brian. I just think he does bring tremendous talents to this. And got 33 week, retweets, I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are some of our folks that are presenting at McCall and McCall if you haven't been to the renovated Cobo Hall oh my gosh it's just it's just something to be really proud about in Detroit mm -hmm. but our guys just represented us Michelle is our new technology person and I can't tell you how much praise we're getting from the field on this she's a very well established person you met her in an earlier meeting worked in the UP for years and the UP has really led the state in a lot of this interactive and technology driven thing so she, she they were just praising her in this very session where I was sitting in the back of the room this is where I did a prop one thing I found out I did it illegally a little bit because I I need to be more careful and say that I'm as as a person voting for mm -hmm. proposal one, which I've just said, um, but I've got to be more clear as state soup. You can just present the facts, I guess. This is really an outstanding place. Um, I, I, you know, you know, you just heard at our legislative lunch, uh, if I may, since you brought it up, Lupe, but your background and coming here as a migrant worker and then finding out in this particular case, here's one of the aberrations of reform. We, we, we brought a few of these to your attention in the past. This one was a new one to me, which is that our migrant children come in in the beginning of the year and then leave, mm -hmm. kind of know this intellectually, and then come back to take tests. Mm -hmm. And then people in the system are held accountable for things that they maybe don't even have anything to do with. So it's one of the quirks in this evaluation thing that we need to continue to work on, but just do its outstanding work. This was not only a nationally recognized school, this is one of our beating the odds schools. Went to that, saw the big shot at the high school basketball championship, I guess that was, and a couple of weeks ago. Went over, coincidentally the same day, a Saturday, they asked if I'd speak to some of the teacher candidates at MSU. We've got a lot of good people in the pipeline. That's excellent. You're a grad, are you not, Melody? Sure. I mean, my daughter also. <laughs> so end. that's my feeble attempt at some kind of looking like I know technology a little bit. <laughs> and, um, and then just last, I thought with one of the, the senator, I think it was heartfelt, he brought something up at our lunch that I think is genuinely the perception that somehow we're not Tennessee and we're not Massachusetts and we're, you know, our teachers have moved the graduation rate to 77%, the highest of all time. It's been consistently rising, even in spite of the Michigan Merit Curriculum, where everyone said the whole world was going to collapse when that happened. Our teachers have moved dropout rates down 33%. Our teachers and the, the whole system has moved. Last year alone, the ACT scores went up 15%. And then finally, I think the one that maybe this department as much as teachers in the field deserve some uh, credit on is third grade reading proficiency. It, it was about 50% and now it's at two thirds of the kids reading at grade level in a relatively short period of time. And as you know, that's kind of the key stat. We can get kids reading at in fact, I, on Family Facebook last night, they were making a joke about one of my grandkids, and I said, as long as he's reading at third grade level, by third grade, I'm good. They didn't laugh. They didn't know exactly what the <laughs> heck I meant by that. But it's such an important mark, and I, can't, I appreciate the progress that's been made. So we're going to stretch this out a little bit more with David's. They, they are, they're, they're downstairs or on the way up. 
Okay, then maybe we'll do employee participation, employee uh, introduction, save Melody for after that so she has enough time, but why don't we do that first and then we'll move on. So I've had a chance to meet with um, some of these people here who are joining our staff and I would invite them to stand and tell you a little bit about what they're doing and where they're working. Uh, first with Mohammed Sadek. Uh, Mohammed Sadek, I'm in the Office of uh, Career and Technical Education uh, with the Game Unit, Grants, uh, Assessment, Monitoring, and uh, Evaluation Unit. I'm uh, mainly, some of my duties includes uh, developing, pro processing, and administering uh, requests for proposals. And also I'm the department lead and uh, liaison for the Next Plus, which is Michigan uh, Electronic Grant System. Thank you. And would you like to work in the game unit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Leanne Reyes, also with CTE. Good afternoon. Uh, Leanne Reyes. I am in the Office of Career and Technical Education. I'm not in the fun unit. I'm in the other unit, uh, CRU Career <laughs> Readiness Unit. Uh, but it's a pretty great team. Uh, I'm the secretary for the last company. And then finally from CTE, uh, Mary, Mary Stevenson. Hello, I'm Mary Stevenson. I'm the Executive Secretary for the Office of Career and Technical Education. She replaced a 30-year veteran, 30-plus year veteran. 40 plus. Uh, if, that, <laughs> if that doesn't tell you something about that group. <laughs> office personnel. And then finally for me from the Office of, uh, of Field Services is Alexandra Holmeyer. Hello, I'm Alexandra Homeyer. I'm currently working as a student assistant. Um, I'm helping with process improvements and department-wide initiatives within the Divi Division of Education Services. Okay, um, and I introduced um, Scott briefly earlier, but I uh, would like to reintroduce Scott Koenig from the Office of Standards and Assessments. You can tell us Thank you. about yourself. Well, I'm your social studies uh, content lead for assessments, so standards and assessment is the office I work in. And we're crossing fingers and manning the phones, and uh, everything has been going really well. And we're very pleased with where we're at progressively uh, within the assessment uh, piece right now. So thanks for welcoming me. Yeah. Would you all please, oh, please welcome our new folks? <laughs> I did forget to mention, I know I told you I was singing in the shower apparently, but my first week of retirement, my wife surprised me yesterday because she knows since I was a kid, I'm this old, that my last day as a teenager, I literally spent at Woodstock. You can figure out the math here. And, but she has gotten, at Comerica Park, she's gotten two pretty good seats at Rolling Stones concert, my first week. So I'll be the hippie in the audience in August. So. There. So why don't we, uh, we amended the agenda. John did this today with, we all did this, but it was suggested by Michelle earlier today. So maybe would you like to uh, give a preview okay. to this, Michelle? Um, well, um, as probably many of you know, the, um, there's been a group of folks meeting in Detroit to try to um, improve the uh, education um, uh, of, and the future of education for Detroit school children, so it's the coalition for the um, <clears throat> future of Detroit school children. And it's, a, it's an incredibly diverse group. I'm sure, I'm sure all of you have read about it in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, and they have been working hard. I'm on, I've been on the policy subcommittee, but the steering committee has especially been working long hours and very hard on this um, with lots of, um, in a very difficult, sometimes very difficult climate. But I think it was so diverse that it brought um, <clears throat> a lot of good ideas, and it was amazing how much consensus was built from such a diverse group. And the recommendations that they're going to be discussing um, are, are online. They're here as well, and I think they have, David has some more to go. Um, and uh, they're going to speak about them, and, and I, I hope you all take them, um, uh, really look at them closely, and the legislature and the governor looks at them closely, because I think it's, um, I think they're spot on. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I must say, Mike, with with uh, 
all the respect I've had for you, if I knew your last day of being a teenager was at Woodstock and that you were so versed in the who, I, you know, my respect would have. Uh, Sorry. But, but uh, in, in a serious vein, Mike, despite the last time I'll be at this table with you as, as superintendent, so just let me thank you for your leadership, for your commitment to the children of Michigan, and for in the various positions you've held in education that we work with you on for all you have done for the children of Michigan. We, uh, it's greatly, greatly appreciated the work you've done. Thank you. Uh, Superintendent Flanagan, uh, Chairman Austin, uh, members of the board, I'm David Hecker, President of the American Federation of Teachers Michigan and one of the co-chairs of the Coalition for the Future of Detroit School Children. To my left, I think you all know, is Tanya Allen, the uh, head of the Skillman Foundation, uh, another of the, one of the five uh, co-chairs of the coalition. And I think you know the gentleman to my right, Hester Wheeler, um, I think best known for being the 12-year uh, executive director of the Detroit branch of the NAACP, but also serving as a top aide to County Exec Picano and now as the innovation, chief innovation officer for black family development. And due to the generosity of black family development, uh, Hester has joined us for the implementation phase of this. Implementation, by that I mean moving these recommendations forward so they, they can become policy. And sitting in the chairs behind us are some people who joined Michelle in, in working on a number of the various subcommittees. All in all, there was a 36-member uh, steering committee, uh, about 140, 150 people like Michelle who worked on subcommittees. And many of these subcommittees had meetings throughout the community uh, to hear from community members, teachers, students, um, et cetera. Uh, th this group uh, came together uh, because of a couple of facts. Uh, one fact is that in the city of Detroit, 14 different entities can open and close schools, and there is no coordination whatsoever among them. Um, Secondly, as while there are many great things going on in various schools throughout Detroit, overall, I think we would all say academic performance uh, is not what we all want it to be. It's not what our students deserve. And we also know this isn't unique to Detroit, that there are many school districts, too many school districts, that are either uh, um, having difficulty with academic performance and or financially. So while these are, is a coalition that came together out of the Detroit community to put together uh, these recommendations, we really see most of these recommendations uh, as if implemented, lifting up all school districts in the state. That is, that is indeed, uh, without a doubt, our hope. Again, Detroit does not stand alone with the issues it faces, uh, it faces educationally. Uh, as Michelle said so well, we were, uh, we are, excuse me, we are a very, uh, a very diverse uh, group in every way you could think of, including politically. And and it was a, uh, it was a great process to see people, uh, perhaps from uh, my political uh, landscape, moving in a certain direction from hearing certain facts, and people who were perhaps from a different. Uh, political mindset, seeing certain facts and, and moving along based on those facts to what Michelle described uh, as really a total consensus report, which we think has some real uh, outstanding and bold <coughs> recommendations. But process-wise, uh, I think was something that doesn't happen enough in our society, in our culture, uh, in our country people coming together for the good of the cause, the children in Detroit, in this case, basing decisions on facts and coming to, uh, coming to a consensus. Uh, so, you know, we worked over, uh, over three months. Uh, uh, people put in an incredible amount of time, a real tribute to, uh, to our community. Um, and we came up with these, uh, with, with these set of, of recommendations. Um, do you want to go through them, some of them, Tanya, or how would you like to proceed? Sure, happy to. Um, so we have a set of recommendations that could really be described um, in four categories. 
One is around strengthening the infrastructure of public education in general. So many of the things that we see that's happening in Detroit are is kind of the canary of the mind of what's happening at the state level, which you guys are um, pretty familiar with. Um, but I think that most people in Detroit, when they started to look under that microscope, um, were shocked at how um, how how aligned um, many of the state policies were in creating the conditions. And then you can actually really see the projection of how those conditions would be cr created in Detroit. So um, some of the main things that we're talking about and things I'm sure you guys would be in support of is uh, looking at that, making sure that we advance the adequacy study, really trying to look at how school districts are funded, thinking about the three thinking about instead of a one-year funding, especially for shrinking districts, to look at maybe three-year funding cycles so that we can responsibly shrink districts. Um, that Since we know that the majority of districts in our state are shrinking, um, that we would like for the state to take um, responsibility for uh, the DPS legacy that as a result of its imprint on the district for the last um, 15 years or so. And it's not about blame in any way from our perspective on this, but um, if you left it with the school board and they did it, then it would be completely our responsibility, even though it might have been broader contextual and policy issues that created this the condition where the district went from 200,000 to about 45. But since it wasn't in a school board's hand, it was in the state's. And so as you kind of take responsibility, um, uh, if you t assume responsibility and you have to take responsibility for the outcomes regardless of your intentions. So we are uh, advocating for that um, as well as operational and a forensic audit of the district because we know that significant transitions need to happen there. We're also um, advocating um, for a set of governance fixes too that we think are important in the city. Uh, one is that we are we believe that DPS needs to leave and exit emergency uh, management and that it's returned to an elected board. We know that it will be a process to get them there and prepare them and we want to make sure that they're successful. We also are asking um, that the state um, support fund and empower. Now I know this is uh, a challenge on the SSRO because we were not in support of that being moved, but we wanted that. We want the SSRO and SSRD fully funded and empowered. Um, we see the EAA as a workaround <coughs> to um, current public policy, and that just doesn't make sense to us. So we've recommended that the interlocal agreement be uh, canceled. Uh, we also talked about how do you now that you have all of this infrastructure, how do you get the infrastructure there, not the EAA, um, to this SSRO so that the SSRO is fully equipped with all of this investment? We don't want to throw the investment out the door. Um, advocating for stronger um, governance and transparency around charter schools and their boards, that they have more independence between the EMOs, um, and also that the authorizers have more accountability in their performance, especially um, uh, since you know the National Association of Charter School Authorizers gave them three out of um, a possible 40 points in terms of quality measures that the state has. Um, and then uh, the biggest one of the biggest recommendations we've advanced is the Detroit Education Commission, which it would be a local entity or body that would look over the 14 different entities that are opening and closing schools in Detroit and bring a little bit of uh, coherence and uh, logic to what's happening in our education landscape. So just for context, Detroit had 200,000 students. Uh, a total, the city had actually about 230,000 students uh, 50, 20 years ago. Uh, 200 of those were in Detroit public schools. Um, maybe about 15 to 20 was in DPS and then others went to private schools and some schools outside of the city. Uh, today, Detroit has 120,000 students, and they go to 70 different districts. And one district has, Detroit has 45,000, um, and then there's a little bit, maybe 47 that are in charters that are across the city and in the suburbs, and then there are 11 different districts outside of the city. So there's no coherence. We don't know where our children are. Um, I actually did this, um, we do a study, we've done a couple of studies at the Skillman Foundation on when schools have closed, just tracking kids and where they're going, how they're making choices. We've done that with three different schools in the city, um, and each time we cannot find 20% of the kids. 
So they have, you know, obviously they have a state tracking record. Sometimes it may be records, it may be, but we can't have a coherent vision strategy to improve schools in Detroit without responsibility and without a system to manage them. Um, so those are many of the things that we're talking about as well as some basic common services and I'll be quiet so you guys can dig into questions. Student, and, um, student data enrollment system, which I just gave you the logic behind. Transportation, so that we can have um, people have equitable choice. Um, a crummy choice is not a choice at all in my book. Uh, and right now Detroit has a ton of crummy choices. Uh, and then the last is to um, focus on um, uh, how to streamline special education. Um, and uh, there was one other thing, transportation. Uh, the regional councils? And the regional councils. Um, part of the other thing that we know around this uh, in general especially around governance, is you know, Detroit has to wear the scarlet letter. We wear a scarlet letter of having the worst schools in the state of Michigan in the way that it's articulated, yet we have no governance over them. Uh, and so at the school board under emergency management, the EAA, which is a semi kind of state entity or whatever you want to describe it, uh, or even with the authorizers, which are as far as 400 miles away. Um, and out of that process, Detroiters are disengaged. We have, in order to improve education, it's sheer responsibility for everybody, include the, including Detroiters. And one of the things we're advocating for is that we um, have uh, increased our agency. And one of the things that we want to do that through is by having these local and regional councils um, which are made up of representative of schools who can look at and make decisions about in alignment with the Detroit Education Commission that can look at how we um, open and close schools what's the um, supply and demand because there's a huge mismatch in general related to it so if I could just uh, two quick comments on the EAA front we call for the 15 schools to go back mm -hmm. to to DPS <laughs> And just uh, sort of an anecdote, just to underscore the, uh, the transportation issue that, that Tanya went through. Uh, there's a great parent organization, a parent and community organization in Detroit called 482 Forward. And one thing they've done, and, and Tanya's done this, I've done this, uh, is so, so we can really experience. You know, you can read about something, someone could tell you something, and it has an impact, but just so much of an impact. So uh, one day, about a month and a half ago, John Ricolta, who was one of our other co-chairs, and I met up with the family, uh, the Robinson family, uh, in their apartment in Detroit, and went with Ms. Robinson and her, her two kids. Uh, each went to different charter schools around eight blocks apart uh, to school to see what they have to do every day to get to school. And so we had to walk to the first bus, city bus, take the bus to a second bus, wait uh, at McGraw and Junction in the city for the second bus, then take the second bus down, then walk to uh, the young man's school, then double back to the, uh, to the young girl's school. And uh, that trip to school took an hour and a half. Uh, John Ricoulter went on his GPS, 10 minutes. And don't forget the mom has to come back. And in this case, the kids got a ride home, but in most cases they don't, so they would have to, they would have to come back. I mean, the kids are doing extremely well in school, but, uh, I, I, you know, John and I told them just such respect for them. I, I can't, can't imagine my kids spending, to be honest, an hour and a half each way to school. I know if, if you live uh, up north and your school district is multi-county, sometimes that happens. We're here, we're talking about a 10-minute drive in the city of Detroit. Or and five miles. Uh, right. Uh, and because of the, the lack of transportation, you know, there's choice, but, you know, crummy choice isn't choice, but choice that you can't get to also isn't choice. Uh, so, it, you know, stories like that, or, you know, it's not, it's not a story. The facts like that uh, really bring home uh, the need for that one recommendation of transportation, but there are stories behind and facts behind all the recommendations here. Esther? I'll just add one quick perspective. As a, a lifelong Detroiter and a longtime advocate for the city of Detroit, uh, and one who has been communicating uh, the recommendations in this report over the last seven or eight or ten days, I didn't expect something this good. <laughs> That's how much Hester thinks. I did not Tanya expect. And I and yeah. everybody no, else. no. I, I mean, uh, <laughs> thirty plus people: black folk, white folk, uh, suburban folk, and urban folk, and rural folk, and. Uh, Democrats, Republicans, folk who don't traditionally try and work together all sat 
uh, still for some extended hours. I mean, they worked late into the evening, late into the night, weekends, and came up with a set of very, very bold recommendations. Uh, this will get us much further than we've ever been. The last 20 years has been a lot of chaos. Most Detroiters have had no reason to pay attention to what happens in the Detroit Public Schools because they've had nothing to say about it. So Michelle and so many others, we appreciate all of you and all of your input. This is good stuff. We need you. I, I, I expect that many of you have read it already, uh, but you might want to read it and reread it because it's really, really good. This can get us. Uh, I mean, Michigan doesn't have to rank at the bottom. And I love page four in particular because it says really uh, the way that I'd love to think. One state, one city, one standard, excellence. Yeah. Thank you. you know, Tanya, David. Thank you. Esther, I've had the privilege of knowing you guys for years, and you're just iconic leaders, and this is really a tremendous effort. And it's actually our honor to have you here today, and I think John's going to start out with some comments. And then Cassandra. Well, likewise, I want to really applaud the work of the commission, you leaders of it, but also I see behind you others who have stake in this and the folks to collectively put this together. Um, I mean, it is impressive, and I think it does provide a set of both specific ideas and some sort of a strategy for how to bring some kind of sanity and some sensible strategy to improve learning and quality education for Detroit in what is to be generous a chaotic landscape of public education. Uh, <coughs> and that's no mean feat. I mean, my own hope was that the governor, the legislature, we, in whatever way we could, should embrace your recommendations and figure out how we can help enable them and animate them. Uh, in part, not just because they're good ideas and it is a strategy for how to improve learning, but it's coming from the community, it's not coming imposed from outside, yes, sir. which has been one of the dynamics that's been so unfortunate. Um, my question is, talk to us more about how the governance would work, this commission, what it does. The charter authorizers would still authorize charter schools. Um, who appoints the commission? What powers does it have as it tries to create some sort of sanity in this opening, closing chaos of many people authorizing schools? How do you see that working? That would be one piece that even yeah. the other said makes some sense. So I want to understand how it would work. Right. So it would be a commission that basically um, has governance over um, – governance isn't the right word. Um, it has uh, – oversight over the quality of schools um, in general. So it would set one standard, all schools have to abide by that standard. It'd be a way um, for uh, this commission to right size the education landscape um, because there's such a mismatch in Detroit in general about schools. So it does three things and there are a lot more small subtle things that we do but we're trying not to usurp any power of local boards um, except for a few things. Um, so not trying to usurp power of a charter board or a DPTS board, but what we're saying is we think it needs to open, close, and uh, any schools um, based on performance. So really setting a standard. And so it becomes like a gatekeeper to the authorizers and also to the district um, so that schools aren't, areas aren't overpopulated, et cetera. The second thing that it does is it provides school planning in general and siting of facilities, um, what we need, understanding that right now there's a projection that DPS, not DPS, but our population in the city of Detroit is going to continue to decrease. Um, I think it's what, by 2020? 600. 2020, yeah, yeah. that it, we should, they are projecting that DPS, Detroit may be at 600 and they're saying that DPS may be at 25,000 students. So it means that we have to do a ton of pruning. Um, and I'm not saying cutting, I'm using the word pruning intentionally because there might be some consolidations, there may be some closures, but there are some places where there are deserts and there are no good schools on it. Um, that, uh, so that's all kind of one. The second is that we have to have a centralized place of being able to look at some data for the city of Detroit because of these 60 plus districts so we can figure out um, what's the trend lines, what's going on with our kids in general. We can't do it. Just, you know, finding the graduation rate for the city of Detroit, you're going to be hard pressed because you got to figure out 60 different districts and then do the compilation of the number. Now, and we always rely on what DPS is doing and they only have less than half the market share. And then the third thing is to um, orchestrate um, or help lead and maybe in some cases do a set of shared services, um, transportation, enrollment, data, 
um, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, we are recommending that the mayor uh, make the appointments to the commission. Uh, and um, we know that at the state level, that there are other people <laughs> who want to make recommendations there, but we're, you know, staying steadfast and saying that this needs to be, at some point, Detroiters have to be responsible for um, the education of our children, and we're willing to take that responsibility. Excellent. Cassandra, please. Uh, well, I too want to commend you for the work that you did and the report. I think it has a lot of excellent ideas in it. Um, and I, I truly hope the governor and the legislature um, pay very close attention and do, rather than cherry pick, actually take the report as a whole and look at it. Um, I had one question. And when I read the report and listening to you, it sounds very clear what your recommendation towards the Education Achievement Authority is. And that is that those schools go back to DPS. But then a week after you came out with your report, there was an editorial in one of the Detroit papers that quoted, or they, they seemed to quote you, saying, oh, no, 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 the EAA is going to exist, it, what, nothing's changing. Um, where is that, that yeah. miscommunication or that, that yeah, no, I'm from. happy to answer that one because I was trying to figure it out too. I was like, when did I say that or whatever? Uh, so, because I'm like, I didn't say that. And then I actually figured it out. Um, so I did a um, blog that was responding to the crit critics. And in the blog, I say we need to fund SSRO, SSRD. We need to populate it. The EAA is a workaround. It needs to go away. The EAA infrastructure could be migrated up to the state level. Well, my communications person edited it, and she didn't think that the word infrastructure was important to the EAA's infrastructure. So they grabbed that out of that and then laid out that editorial. So I wasn't a party to that editorial. I didn't know that it was coming. You know, I didn't know what they were putting in there. And so it makes it seem like I was complicit in making this statement with them when I wasn't. Okay. Thank you for clearing that up. I see our media guys got that down, right? You got that? <laughs> Other comments from Kathleen? Well, I, too, commend you. I, I, I must say I agree with Hester. It's much better than I anticipated. <laughs> Once again, we're held in high regard. Thank you, Kathleen. <laughs> no, thank you, I, was, I was very dubious about it, and you know that. Right. Uh, but uh, you have made some very good recommendations, I think. And you, the fact that, that it is such a diverse group and that they came together is quite remarkable. Um, having John Ricolta and David Hecker agree on these things is really <laughs> terrific. There were some passionate discussions. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, you know, so I was going to say, you know, for, for me, V, and I've said this to Tanya many times, for me, and I'll let's use this as an example, this coalition, if I believe that someone's bottom line is what I believe should be the bottom line, so in this project, what's best for the kids in Detroit, then I could work through the obvious differences, different approaches mm -hmm. to things that John Ricolta and I have. Yeah. We, could work, we could work through that mm -hmm. because I have 100% respect that while we're, we look at things somewhat differently, that his bottom line are the kids mm -hmm. in Detroit. Well, I, I think Tanya described it very well. There are so many different authorizers in Detroit, and they don't coordinate with each other at all. And there's no, there's no rhyme or reason You'd think they would do research before they went into an area, but they can have three schools with different authorizers That's in the same That's little good. area, and then That's another right. area doesn't have any. So yeah. it's really uh, very chaotic, and it doesn't serve the, the, the uh, city well. It doesn't serve the students well. It doesn't serve the community well. So th th it has to be recognized. But these problems were created by the state but the state policies of authorizing charter schools, school choice as much as they did, and uh, plus the fact that the state had taken over the schools in Detroit, and we now are on our fourth emergency manager, and that's after the, there was a previous takeover with the, the different appointed board, and that was the same idea, though. So it's... Detroit really, the, the people of Detroit have not really run their own schools in many years. So the problems were created by the state, in effect. And Steve Henderson had a very good editorial, yeah, I thought, at Sunday's Free Press. Right. And he said, if you break it, you fix it. Right. And 
according to him, the state broke it and we should be fixing it. So I, I agree with that, and I, I think that that's, that's very important. Uh, I was skeptical about the commission in the beginning because I thought that you're giving the Detroit Public School Board, the elected board, back to the people of Detroit and have them, have them be represented by their board, and then you have a commission over it. But the, the, you do need the commission somehow or other to create some order out of the chaos right. of, of creating new schools and right. where they go and all that kind of thing. So, and I, 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 I wouldn't, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I was gonna say, it's really very much like a baseball commissioner. <laughs> Like, you know, we're, the baseball commissioner doesn't tell the team how you, who you pick for your talent, what you do, how you go, you know, what number of runs you're gonna, all, any of that strategy. But they do say, you can exist in this city or not. <laughs> like, you're existing, if you do these things, you make it bad for everybody else. It's just that very slim kind of environmental support. I'm sorry, David. That's okay, I was gonna say, Tanya learned over all these months that if she wants me to understand, it better be a baseball <laughs> analogy, or I'm lost. But, but, but I, I, I was just gonna say, it, you know, DEC really isn't over the Detroit School Board. It really yeah. isn't over any of the charter school boards. There, there is one piece, open and closing, that yes, a traditional school board would have that power that the Detroit School Board will not. But uh, so it's it, it's that piece that goes to uh, D.C. But the D.C. isn't over the right. Detroit School Board for all the work that it will be doing. Okay. Yeah, but I think it is important to have it. Yeah, I, no, absolutely. I've now come yeah. to support the idea. But I also have the, the question that, that Cassandra raised. I, I have concerns about the uh, op-ed that uh, that Joyce Giles and, and uh, Steve, Steve Hamp wrote Steve because they. They don't imply; they state that 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 the M, that the EAA will become the <coughs> reform office. And that that's why the governor has already transferred it, so that this was all sounded like what they wrote that this was all in the planning. And I don't know if if they know something you don't know, or if you just have conflicting ideas of what's going to happen. And when when can you say the schools go back to the EA to the Detroit Public right. Schools? When? Yeah. The question is when, and right. how long and does the they're, EAA they're, stay there? That's right. There's no date in the report. Um, to be honest, there's probably a difference of opinion among the coalition as to yeah, uh, members as to when that should happen. Uh, the uh, you know when you do coalition work, you 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 compromise on things, and some things you just don't address, right? Uh, because there's a lot bigger thing yeah. like this this report to get to. But, uh, but I'll tell you something that I think everybody uh, on the coalition uh, supports is even those who think they should go back right away or those who think it should be longer, uh, that it, ha it has to be returned in a way that is obviously not disruptive to the children, right? right? So, so if, it, if it goes back, and all that's really done is that EAA comes off the school and DPS goes up, and the kids are attending the same, the same schools, and uh, then you know that's not disruptive. If uh, if other things need to happen, you know, I'm one who would rather have it happen sooner rather than later. But my bottom line is it has to happen in a way that's not disruptive to the kids' education. Right, and I would say, I mean, I think part of it is self-preservation, right? I mean, <laughs> we came out with recommendations that we said that the EAA, um, the agreement that creates it should be dissolved. And they are coming out in ways trying to position themselves to, to be relevant and to have a role in the future. Um, and so I, I, and I, so I actually, I think the thing that was interesting about it is I glanced at the editorial and I never really read it, read it, because I just assume like everybody has the right to try and do self-preservation. I don't, I don't personally, I don't know what, I don't think they have a clarity about what they want to do, what they want to be. I don't think, I have not heard any clear plan about even the SSRO or SSRD. I mean, I hear a ton of criticism from each of the entities and a ton of speculation, but nobody, there has not been any coherence about how that's described in any way. I think we are clear about what we think needs to happen. Does the state need to have a strategy to help low-performing schools? Absolutely. 
Does that strategy need to support Detroit because we have a high number of support? Yes. Do we need a separate entity, um, EAA, when we have a state law and a state district that um, is able to do that? No. Should the schools um, and should that entity or strategy, whatever it may be, should it start with a heavy hand of taking schools that leaves districts financially um, um, disadvantaged? Absolutely not. You should start it with a lighter touch and you um, escalate it as it's needed. Um, and so those were the things that we absolutely agreed on and, and making sure that those schools get transitioned back to the DPS and that they are revisited and reviewed by SSRO and SSRD to decide what should happen to them, but they should go back to the district. Um, and I think what that to me, what's important, even about this, when you think about the SSRD, is EAA should be a cautionary tale to us about any place. I, so I looked at the top to bottom list and you know, you could, Litchfield, is that the right name of the city? Um, the, the place, I don't even know if it's a city, the town in Michigan, it has two schools uh, in its entire district. They're both on um, the uh, priority listing or whatever the right name is. If, e, if a SSRO or SRD decided to take one school out of that and put it in the district, you destroy that whole system. I, that, you know, or if you go into a um, city where there are 12 schools and you take two or one, that may be financially equivalent to the 15 that came out of DPS. And so we have to really look at this um, and construct public policy that is going to be supportive of how we help districts improve, especially when so many of them are shrinking, you cannot separate school performance from district performance. That's my aha in all of this, so. Excellent points. Thank you. Lupe, please. I just wanna say <clears throat> something from the west side of the state, from Grand Rapids in particular, uh, to Detroit. I, as an educator, as a citizen, as a state board member, I am very proud of this document that you came up with. For two years, I, I've been sitting on this board and many different people from Detroit and on uh, members from the, of the board have indicated their concerns about what's happening in education in Detroit. And you took the, the, the concern and you have developed some recommendations and, and strategies or and put it in this booklet. It's very easy to read. I, I'm very fortunate that I work with the Michigan Department of Education and they had already sent us a summary. So I was able to read that. And when I read that, goosebumps went over my body Good. because mm -hmm. I have been hearing so many <laughs> testimonies of people that are concerned about what's happening in Detroit. I don't live in Detroit, but I live in the state of Michigan. And I, I, Detroit is a very important city to our state, so it's very important that the educational piece, the education of our students, gets gripped by the citizens, you, and, and have developed this document. So I, I, any way that I, from the west side, can be of assistance to you a, as you progress with your, your process here, I'd be more than happy to, to help. I know that some schools and some personalities from Detroit have been going to Grand Rapids public schools to see what they're doing over right, there right. with our transformation plan right. to see if there, it can be incorporated in what you're doing. Uh, so that, of course, I taught for, with them and was a principal in many different things for many, many years. And so my you know, loyalty is to Grand Rapids. And the superintendent is doing a very, very good job as, as she moves forward because, as you said, this problem is not just Detroit. Right. We, we, had, we have some of it in Grand Rapids, but it takes some brave people to move the agenda forward, and you're doing it for Detroit. So from whatever you do, we're going to learn from that. From whatever we're doing in, in Grand Rapids, you're learning we'll from, learn that. from that. So that's how it works. We cannot work in silos in the educational field. We have to work together. That's what we told the legislators. They cannot just be doing whatever they want to over there and you over there and us over here. We have to work together to make this work. So I commend you and I commend you and I commend you. This document is fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
John, then Irene. Irene. Irene, then John. Uh, so Lupe just made my speech. Um, <laughs> I'd love to make it again, but she's a lot better at it than I am. Um, but she did say a couple of things that are important for us to say, too, which is that her loyalty to, is to Grand Rapids. I know Lupe well enough to know that her loyalty is a, to every child right, in the state right, of Michigan. Right, yeah. And in presenting this to us and, and um, bringing a life to the faces who put it together, for all of you who came, thank you so much. Uh, we can't understand the, the ramifications for the children all over the state, but we hear, we, we understand that every uh, problem that's, that's uh, addressed in this um, study and, and, and by the commission is something that other children are facing. So in our responsibility to the whole state, um, we can embrace your work and embrace this document and wish you Godspeed with the next steps um, uh, because they're important for every child. We can't comment on the specifics, and uh, we don't know how it will work out politically mm -hmm. or economically because those are unfortunately not our purview. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you uh, from the bottom of our hearts because um, for every problem that you brought up, there are 30 communities that I know personally and right. so many more right. that are, are, are turning around with boards who <coughs> don't know what to do uh, and haven't been able to figure out a strategy right. for it. So thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Thank you. John? Um, I'm glad you all came up here. Thanks for coming and getting here on short notice for everybody. It's really important. So, Tanya, to your point, we're just looking at you know what Massachusetts does with their turnaround strategy. They start with the state working with the district that hosts the schools to say, how can we help you and re-engineer your systems to better support learning and effectiveness in that school? They don't take it out right away. Exactly. Which is a good, you know, a, a good point for us to reiterate. There's a good way to do this, and it starts with first working together with the district so that they re-engineer. Uh, and support the school to success as the job one. Um, I, Dan Varner, I see, isn't with you, our former colleague. You guys keep him out of this so he didn't mess it up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just he's doing well in the line. I see his name yeah, Dan was yeah. great, very the committee. Uh, yeah. He co-chaired uh, the governance yeah. committee, one of the, the bigger issues uh, to grapple with, so it was great to have uh, uh, Dan on working so hard on this. Yeah. Great. Well, great work. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks Thank you. Um, and Richard. Yeah, um, it, it really was a privilege to um, and to be a part of it, and I um, understand from, I'll continue to be a part of it with the policy committee. <clears throat> and then I have to tell you, I've taken some heat from some people in the community, <clears throat> and I um, and I think you've probably heard the same criticisms. So um, some of the concerns, and I think some of the concerns are legitimate, and, and one is with the um, the DEC and how it's going to operate. And there's a concern that it will favor charter schools over traditional public. It will um, become dominated by people of a certain interest to the detriment of traditional public schools. And so um, so I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to that and um, on that issue. Um, there are other concerns with regard to, um, I think that's probably the main one. Uh, that I've been hearing a lot about. Well, the, the, the uh, you know, the, the state reform office, the, the officer, and how that's going to operate. And um, to make sure that it's not just a way to codify the EAA, which is um, and to sort of get around mm -hmm. um, the legislation that couldn't be passed. So you know, those are the two issues, and I, I just wanted to give an opportunity to respond. If I could know. answer the first one, I think, you know what's striking to me um, is that uh, all of the public school, traditional public school people say they think that the DEC is going to favor charters and put traditional schools out. And all of the charter people right. say, right. we think that it's going <laughs> to charter, it's going to favor traditional schools and try and put the yeah. charters out. Right. Um, and, and I actually think that's a great place to be right. because <laughs> that's exactly what we want is that it's not going to favor either one of them. It's going to favor merit. If you perform, you can do well, but there's nobody, there's not anybody collectively in Detroit, the traditional system or the charter system, that could stand on any platform that talks about merit, because all of them are crummy. Uh, and so, I, you know, so I, I, that's like the one thing that I, I can talk about all kinds of things that are political, but it's the one that just pisses me off every time I hear it. <laughs> Because it's like these schools are so focused on ideology and not focused on success for children. And that's what this commission is trying to put a platform for. And we and part of the reason that we actually talked about having it appointed by the mayor 
um, uh, from our perspective was that we didn't want it to be subject to political, we wanted to protect it as best as we can from political capture um, around elections. And so I use this and I say it lovingly to David is, you know, so all of the conservatives say the unions are gonna, they would take over the elections. And, uh, and the traditional school people don't say this, but they ought to. You ought to be worried about the uh, charter lobbyists who could take over that. So what we're trying to do is protect it as best as we can um, and trying to put in as many caveats that actually would, one, not allow it to ever take more power than it possibly could. Um, so being very clear about what its powers are, what its lanes are. Um, and then I think the second thing is, um, uh, being really clear about setting up the structure of those appointments so that the appointments, so you can never have that swinging in one way or another where you would have favor. I mean, it has to be an un, it has to be agnostic around school governance and um, a zealot around achievement. And let me just reference what a number of people have said during this discussion. When this whole process started three, four months ago, a lot of people said there'll never be agreement given who's at the table because they're real traditional school advocates, they're real <laughs> charter school advocates, or whatever the differences are, and we came to an agreement. Richard, you're next, sir. I, uh, I raised my four kids uh, in Detroit, the, uh, near the corner of Evergreen and Six Mile, and I deeply appreciated the opportunity to choose. And in the course of my four kids, they attended Detroit public schools, they attended parochial schools, they attended charter schools. So the uh, ability to choose and the ability for parents to choose, I, I think, is, uh, is a paramount value. And uh, the, the authority of a commission to determine uh, and coordinate um, different schools is seems to be at variance with with the the choice that's desirable for so many of us who live in Detroit um, having said that I appreciate the work that's gone into this and there are many uh, there are many proposals that I think uh, have merit the real issue with Detroit public schools um, is demographics I wrote my doctorate on the closing of parochial schools in the 1990s, and that essentially, deter that essentially was determined by demographics. Um, and the same trends that I identified there as affecting parochial schools have affected Detroit public schools, and we con continue to see uh, the loss of population. And the real, the real uh, that's what's behind uh, Detroit's continuing emergency manager, because they can never they can never balance the books because people keep leaving and so you have to shrink to, uh, to accommodate the, uh, the smaller pool. So I think the, um, the problem is people leave the city and leave their debt behind. Uh, irresponsible boards overspent, uh, putting that debt on the, on, the, on the shoulders of a future generation and then when that generation left, there was no one left to pay the debt. So I think the states assuming uh, the debt for DPS, um, it makes sense. Um, in terms of uh, consolidating uh, the EAA schools with Detroit Public Schools, I'm, I'm kind of agnostic on that. I'm, I'm not sure what the best uh, route is. The EAA was formed because of another uh, uh, reform measure, the reform district, which is adopted during the Granholm years. Um, it, it seemed to be an intent to say we're serious about school performance. Um, whether that has turned out to be the best policy approach, I, I think, is up, is up for debate. Um, so I think, uh, I, I think that um, uh, si most of these recommendations are well worth considering. Uh, some I think uh, may be debatable, uh, but I deeply appreciate the work uh, on this, and thank you for sharing with us today. Thank you, uh, thank, you thank you, Richard. You know, and, and on the issue of choice, um, so uh, you know, th there will still be uh, a 
a great deal of choice mm. as there is now in in Detroit. And but but we do need we we coalition obviously thinks and it's it's a good debate, good discussion. We uh, we do need some coherence to the system. So if there's a good viable uh, DPS school in a neighborhood, and then a charter school opens up right next door when we don't need extra seats, right? Uh, and some kids leave the DPS school. You know, that may be another choice for those parents, but it also impacts every other child in DPS schools. So, so I think there is. Uh, Choice, yes. Uh, choice is, is part of our educational landscape now, uh, but 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 I also think there is there there is some line where you need to look at that if there is just unbridled choice, uh, you know, what's the possible impact on that on other kids that aren't involved with the family making that choice? Because it you know it impacts everybody else. If a child when a child if you open up a DPS school next to uh, two real strong charter schools. And kids leave the charter schools to the DPS school, you know, it impacts every other kid in those charter schools. So there's still going to be plenty of choice under this model. It's just trying to bring some more coherence to it. Right. Yeah. This is not an anti-choice model right. in yeah. any form or fashion. It's actually recognizing that we do have choice. And now that you've hit a tipping point that more than 50% then individual schools can no longer act like they are individual schools. When you're more than 50% of the delivery system, then you actually have to act like a delivery system. You can no longer act like an individual school. And that's an issue that is in Detroit, but it is an issue that we're going to have to deal, and I would hope that you guys will be wrestling with that at the state level for all schools. Richard to finish, then Pam, then Mike. Yeah, and, and, then and I guess start. that's... <laughs> we're not going to get done. And, and that's, and just so I can note, the different conceptions we're approaching with. Uh, the conception of the study assumes that the education market is a single market and serving a single uh, market interest. And the perception, the, uh, when you attack it as choice, you assume that there are market segments. And so just as DPS put their Flix program right next to their Renaissance program, and there was no conflict. It's not like Flix uh, drop took from well, Renaissance. It's an elementary and a high school. High school. Exactly. So of course right. it and right. exactly. Is an but, the, but hold on one second. Sure. But the three charters that charters are, going, are application. But the schools. three charter that are within that one mile radius is a sure. challenge, because not because it's a challenge to Flix or to Renaissance, because they are destabilizing each other. So you so the state is paying for three buildings within a, a, a one mile radius of each other, and they some of them are low performing, some of them are uh, they are none of them are proven. Let's just say that. Mm -hmm. So you now have families that are going to go to those schools. All three of those schools will be destabilized. All of them are going to provide you a mediocre academic quality because they won't all be fully enrolled. So at some point you got to figure it out. So you're not only trying to destabilize Flix, which isn't actually at risk of being destabilized because it's a school of choice. What you now have is choices that you put on the table and they are destabilized. There is no predictability there and you have to create predictability. If you don't have that predictability in the marketplace, then what you have is an erosion of every school in the city of Detroit and that's what we're seeing. And maybe it is an erosion of, um, of uh, population, but if it's an erosion of population, then tell me why. In the last eight years, we've had such dramatic declines. It's because schools are not focusing on academics. They're focusing on enrollment. They're focusing on putting more funds in their operations and the like. And so I think I, I get passionate about this because it's not about a choice issue. It's about how do we ensure good choices for all kids and making sure that these schools can be stabilized. Everybody's failing from this, the kids, the teachers, Good, passionate debate, Pam, and then Mike. Hey, Michelle, if you were going to say something related no, to just, what, okay, just <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just wanted to echo what the rest of the board um, said and really commend you on sticking through with this. I know that it must have been a tremendous task, to say the least, with all the different uh, dynamics coming together. Folks such as myself, a few miles or a few stops up the 75 corridor, really looking at this because. 
um, you know, and, and uh, not really clear on what was going to come out of this, and then hearing you all talk about how this can be good for the state as a whole, being a, a, a bit apprehensive. But I really thank you for your clarity that you've brought to the table today, and just ask that, you know, finding ways to really kind of like articulate that broadly as far as some of the clarification on the EAA um, discussions um, as well well as the you know the local control as it relates to the to the school board um, the elected school board so I just commend you all thank, thank you, you for ben. coming you, I'm going to give you a real example of why your comments about the structural reform at the timeliness is great you know I thought it was good that the governor said he'd wait till a coalition report before he does some of his work and I am hopeful that he'll accept many of the but here's a real world example. And under the state law, the current law, with the reform office being here, it calls for the state superintendent to use authority to label schools in effect. So we've done that. We've named schools priority schools over the years. I made a decision within that same authority that this year we wouldn't label any schools because of the testing mismatch. But also, so here's, here's a real dilemma until we get the system. Once the EO was announced to move, I thought, okay, I'm not going to publicly get into that so much as to say I'm going to use my authority before the EO happens and I've already decided that the 28 schools would be released from priority status. And the reason is that they've made progress and want to, if, if I was the one under that law that named them, then I can be the one that unnames them before that's taken <laughs> away. Having said that, the disconnect is, and I don't even know this off the top of my head, but what if one of those schools is an EAA school? What does that mean? So we've released them right. from priority status. They're in an EAA situation, but we actually don't have any control over the EAA because they were designated by a Detroit emergency manager. So there's probably each of those individuals. I've been in a lot of these rooms over the 10 years, and I would say, as far as I can see, everyone who's ever been involved in this is trying to do the right thing. It's in the spirit of what you're saying. But the combination of all these separate meetings over many years has created this mismatch so when we have our deficit hearings that we're summoned to speak at every quarter, the single biggest problem we have all these deficits is enrollment instability, not just Detroit, all over the place. So I mean, I think that might be a point if you, if I'm reading the tea leaves, I have no inside information on this, but reading some comments the governor made, there may be some commonality there on how to try to stabilize that so that this isn't just the Wild West and the way you describe. So I mean, I think you're like at a historical moment and, and hopefully can continue to ride this together with the governor, because ultimately, obviously, he's got a big, you know, a big say in this. And uh, <coughs> as the rest of the board has, I mean, it's just outstanding work and really is going to contribute very much to this. Thank so, you, Michelle, thanks for getting us on our agenda today. And thank you for all of you thank for you. taking the time thank to come you. up thank here. You. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to see you. Good to see everybody. All right. And I think we did have, uh, we want to honor because we were out of sync a little bit, but there is one more public participation. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. How are you? I just know your name. I appreciate you. Thank you very much. All right. So. Hey. Pamela, look at her. Ouch. <laughs> uh, I have a <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. They didn't invite me. Tell him. Yeah, I tell him I sit on this board and I should be part of the picture. Absolutely. Okay. Good. How are you? Thank you for your comments. Okay. Good job. <laughs> Good job. I hope that this is just a, like a draft. This is not going to be the document. This is going to be tweaked and tricked and changed and before it's uh, adopted. Pleasure to meet you. What did you teach? teach? Uh, you think the Fantastic. governor is going to accept it? What did you teach? Third grade? Okay. Congratulations. I've actually read a lot about this.
This is just yeah, the end. Yeah. Yeah. Are you giving me something? No, just it's a one. good dress. It's a beginning. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How you doing, man? Yeah. Yeah. Nice to see you. All right, good to see you. Thank you. The governor and see everything together. I was thinking that, too. Kids and not. <laughs> it was smart, man. Nice to see you. Cassandra, nice to see you. Go back to the class. Right. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Great. 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 We have, you know, we have, as every day goes by, a stronger and stronger. Thank you. Thanks so much. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. I think so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as every day goes by, we have a stronger population with the NBA. Yeah, you you write mine, and you. <laughs> we're becoming closer and closer. Okay. Yeah. 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 Congratulations, it's great to meet you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Love your work. Thank you. Just in with no notice. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Oh, there was candy. And I am still very involved in my church. I love my church. I just ask too many questions. We taught you, we told you, that's all you need to know. Because it's all I don't understand. So we all agree to what you get from me. Can we? Yeah. When? This afternoon. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm not We're sure. We're not going to have a lot of debate. I mean, talk I'm not going to say a word. But, Karen's um, not here. I will be no, I was here. going to, and then I decided, you know what? <laughs> yes. No yes. explanation needed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, is there an extra copy of the report? I was supposed to. I didn't. I have one. That's one. Sure. Is there any extra copy? Yeah, sitting right over there. That's an extra. Is that an extra copy, first? No, I was. I was. And it could be. I was keeping it in case someone asked me for one. I know which meeting was this? Was last was legislative. Oh, yeah. So the real man that's going to be Brian, just to let you know, this shows you're really not in charge. <laughs> <laughs> you do this all you want. It won't matter. Okay. Just it sounds <laughs> like it, though, it says. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> good. We're going to go back to public participation with one uh, addition that came in in the middle of our, <coughs> our agenda change. So we're going to honor that. I believe this is probably Bethany Brantney approaching the table. So if you will sit at the end of the table, yes, that'd be great. And you'll have five minutes, and the board does not engage in conversation. And we'll start whenever you're ready. Okay. All right. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I am Bethany Bratney. I am the School Library Media Specialist at Novi High School. Uh, I am a National Board Certified Teacher along with all these people. Um, and I'm here today on behalf of the Network of Michigan Educators to share some success. So success in a school library. Uh, I know you all understand the value of school libraries. You passed, uh, signed that wonderful statement in October in support of school libraries. Um, so I know you know the stats and studies about school libraries and high achievement and test scores. Um, but even with all of those things in mind, I still hear from a lot of people that what does that mean in day to day? What am I, what am I doing day to day that, that helps with those things? What are the successes that I'm having on a day to day basis? So mm -hmm. um, I tried to categorize those things for you into sort of four main roles. Um, and gave you lots of examples. I will not read them all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to highlight the three, uh, three bold bullets, and they go with those four pictures. So um, this year, some of the biggest successes that I've had uh, have been with guest authors. I've coordinated two guest authors coming to my school. Um, on the left picture there is Mark Aronson. He's an award-winning nonfiction author uh, for children and young adults. And the far right is Karen Joy Fowler. She is, she was on the Man Booker Prize shortlist this year. 
um, for her most recent work of fiction. And we coordinated her visit through a long-standing collaboration with our public library. And both, uh, both authors came and had in interaction with our students. They had a first-hand experience and they had very different messages and programs that they were able to do with our students. Um, Mark Aronson, because he's nonfiction, he talked directly to our students in small groups about how he does real world research, how he uses text sets to gather the resources that he needs to write his nonfiction, how he goes for this deep reading knowledge, which is straight out of the Common Core. I couldn't have written it better. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was a really valuable experience. And then Karen Joy Fowler being fiction, she talked to a lot of our ELA students about the writing process, publishing, what that's like, and the struggles, and how she perseveres. And that was incredibly meaningful for them as well. And as a bonus, our Mark Aronson visit, he wrote about our, the visit to our school in a national journal. So then we ended up with national PR, and each of those kids who was in his groups thought he was writing about them. They were so excited. <laughs> um, so it was really incredible experience to have both of them this year. Um, and then the middle picture, the small group of, of kids and me, <laughs> that's our uh, English Lab book club. So English Lab is a class that the students can elect to take if they feel that they have a skills deficit in their ELA class. It's an extra English class for them. And uh, it's a, it tends to be a smaller class. And so this is a program that I have been running in conjunction with that class for five years. It's a book club, but these are not kids who would come to an elective book club after school probably. So we give them an opportunity to connect and read around a high interest text and then give them a chance to meet in a special environment. Of course, there are snacks. Um, and they come and discuss, they relate, they talk about text connections that they're making, text to text connections that they're making between multiple books that they've read. Um, they connect to their backgrounds, which is something we're always you know, trying to get them to do, their background knowledge. Um, and we see these kind of amazing breakthroughs with those kids every time they come down. Um, so that's another, I look forward to that. Every time it's time to have another book club meeting. Um, it's one of my favorite things. And then the only picture I haven't addressed is a read poster there with a young man. Um, so another function of a modern school librarian is still, as it has always been, to promote the library, the programming, and literacy. And so um, I try to do fun things, and one of the things is I make read posters featuring our staff and students to show our own staff and students as role models in reading, to build a community network around reading, sort of form those connections. Um, and that young man in particular was very excited. He won a contest, and one of the prizes of the contest was to be featured on a read poster. <laughs> and he was thrilled, so we put it up, and I found out after the fact that he had been really struggling with his reading, had raised his reading score. His teacher encouraged him to enter the contest. I just drew his name out of a hat, but it all kind of came full circle in a real moment of success for him. So that was really exciting for me as well. Um, so that's just a piece of it. Um, the flyer is a lot of it, um, but I really appreciate having the opportunity to share with you today about the Modern Library. Appreciate Thank you. Thank you very much. Time to be here. I'm glad Thank you had you. the opportunity to. Thank you. We're back in the Committee of the Whole, and we're going to move to an item that we've been looking forward to, and that's the introduction of National Board Certified Teachers. <laughs> Um, I do want to say, and uh, just as a preamble, that uh, I have a number of folks here that were in my class when I taught for 15 years at Wayne State, so it was good to reconnect. And I'm so proud of them to have gotten to this point where they've reached kind of the pinnacle of their profession with that. The report? I'm sorry? Teacher of the Year report? No, it's later. Oh, it's after. It's later. Thanks. So, and we've asked. <laughs> to be corrected by teacher over here that some melody actually is going to uh, work us through this I think she's this is totally appropriate given her her uh, status as teacher of the year so we're going to kick it right over to you yeah, Melanie, I'd love please. To invite our guest. thank you we oh moved ours up just because Sandra we just moved ours up to accommodate I'm 
thrilled to introduce our guests today. On behalf of the Michigan NBCT Network, represented today by Denise Walker, uh, NBC 2010 President and Cheryl Corpus, Secretary, 2011, and the Network of Michigan Educators, I am honored to introduce you to the new National Board Certified Teachers for 2014. These seven teachers have achieved the highest credential available to American educators, national certification through the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. These teachers successfully completed the certification by submitting four portfolios, which included student work samples, videos, and extensive analysis of their teaching and their students' learning. They also completed six assessment exercises demonstrating their deep content knowledge in their chosen content area. I'll introduce them individually, so please step forward or say hello. We have Jennifer Boring Kata. Did I say that correctly? Kata. Kata. Sorry about that. <laughs> Port Huron School District. Um, and she's generalist early childhood. We have Therese Michelle Geist, hello. Southfield Public School District. And her field is mathematics and early adolescence. We have Angela Gwinnett Gloucester. She's from Southfield Public School District also, and her field is literacy, reading, language arts, early and middle school. We have Sally Hamama Nelu, also from Southfield Public School District, and her field is English as new language, early and middle childhood. I should also mention that Sally was my nephew's teacher, and still one of her favorites. And we went to Galileo together. Yes, also, also Galileo. Uh, we have Vanessa Ann Parnell, Detroit Public School District, and her field is Generalist Early Childhood. We have Kimberly Catherine Kelly Wessner, Novi Community School District, Library Media, Early Childhood through Young Adulthood. And we have Gina Lee Wilson, Early College Alliance at Eastern Michigan University, and her field is Mathematics, Adolescence, and Young Adulthood. <coughs> Uh, so I'd just like to say I am not nationally board certified, and I know uh, how much work goes into that, and I've talked to so many teachers who have gone through the process, so I really commend anybody who's willing to put the time and energy and commitment um, and even the, the financial piece towards uh, working towards such a wonderful goal. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Austin, president of the board. Let me give you your uh, nice certificates, oh, and I'll just say if you're nice Sally. Okay, there you go, Thank Sally. You. Therese? Thank Where's Thank Therese? You. Thank you, Therese. Congratulations. Angela. Yeah, yeah. Angela, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer? Thank you. Very nice to meet you. Here we go. Vanessa? Thank you, Vanessa. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Kimberly? Thank you. All right, and Gina. Everybody get one? Thank you. Good. Thank Let me you. just say real quick. I, here we have nothing more important to excellent outcomes for kids than great teaching, right? One of the big challenges in education is we don't provide support and pathways for you as teachers to stay teaching and improve your game and become even better. Uh, here you have a program that both gives you professional recognition and improves your skills uh, and hopefully uh, makes a difference for the learning of kids. You know, and this is so powerful, and I congratulate you for doing it. It's also always, and people have heard me give this talk, it pains me deeply. The Michigan, uh, for a while the program was run out of Michigan. Jim Kelly, Kathy knows Jim. Uh, we were running the program nationally out of Michigan. Uh, since we have never really invested in it and supported it like we should, we have some hundreds of National Board Certified Teachers, of which you are among them. Uh, North Carolina, where you had a governor, Jim, Ke uh, Jim Hunt, over years, who said, you want to improve education? You want to have great teaching? Let's buy into support for National Board Certified Teachers, which they did. They have 18,000 National Board Certified Teachers. Mm -hmm. I've beat on now three governors that if we're serious about education, we should be doing more to help people like you get this both skill and get this credential. But thank you for doing it on your own. <coughs> it's very powerful, and thank you for um, your commitment to help improve the lives of kids. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. to continue to show my newfound technology. Not totally new, I'm tweeting this right now with your picture, so. Right. See how that goes. Snapchat, my kids use Snapchat. 
We think it disappears forever so they can put anything they want on there. Sorry. Real problem. So yes, we're at the minute stage. Um, can I make a motion yes. to approve the minutes of our various uh, special meetings and closed session? I would move we approve items I, J, K, L, M, and N, uh, minutes of our uh, recent meeting. Support. Motion's been made and seconded. <laughs> 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 Would the chair be empty? <laughs> Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? <laughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the minutes have it. I just want to thank, thank uh, Marilyn for oh, yeah. all these minutes. This was a tremendous job of this last five minutes. She does everything, but. This was an extra added attraction, right. so to speak. <laughs> well, no, thank, thank you, Marilyn, for uh -huh. all your work throughout yes. the yeah. busy time we've had. And, and thank the, my fellow board members. It was a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of right. energy uh, with, uh, with good results. So, um, Melanie, we have your time. If she's still there, she's no teacher of the year. She's all right. Oh, she's taking pictures. Go on to the legislature. <laughs> we'll wait, Melanie. <laughs> I'm gonna make a water rod. Anyone want to? Rod. Good. Nice, Millie. Thanks for bringing us those. Your Here. colleagues. You, I was oh. just gonna say, oh, I had Marilyn you just really the nice no. one. I'll take that one. <laughs> I'll take mine back. Are we done? Yes. Thanks, everybody. For thank you for introducing and making sure I got on the agenda. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We got the whole kit and caboodle leadership coming up here. Yeah. Too. yeah. Well, they were here for the, I think the Black Caucus? Or the, yeah, earlier. So which is why they were running. They did just didn't know if they had enough time to run over here. Marilyn? <coughs> <coughs> Marilyn? Yeah. Hmm? Okay. It's just so you can go right to Melanie's when Melody's ready or whatever. Yeah, it's saying trying to connect. Oh, you don't. You don't know how to do that. <coughs> Did that not, was that not that been a lot less money? Yeah. Well, the other side, you know, and it's sort of like the money on the back here. Well, that would probably help. One of the other tactics about it is it's another thing. But even though, oh, now it's saying reconnected. Yeah. Did I lose that connection? Did it show why? Is this supposed to be anywhere? That's special and differential. Oh. Not to suggest that you and Richard having an intimate conversation. Why don't you behave yourself, Michelle? But can I say something in here that I want to be like conveyed? Yeah. Anyone there? No. Sorry. Okay, thank you for your patience. I was talking with Lupe today about how it was a year ago tomorrow that I interviewed for this role. So um, mm. I'm thinking a lot about the finalists now and um, anticipating you know, who will be selected for next year and just how much their life will change. So I look forward to seeing that um, as this year starts to come to an end for me. Um, uh, Mike already talked about McCall. So the McCall Conference is the Michigan Association of Computer User Learners. I think I said that right. Um, but this is one of the biggest conferences uh, in the entire state. 
And this was actually my first experience uh, attending McCall and presenting at McCall. So during the pre-conference, I got to speak with um, Michigan Virtual University teachers. Um, so that was a great experience, and I've been learning more and more about um, their organization. Then I got to just be an attendant for um, a, a day or two at McCall as well, and Photo there was bomb. a, what's that? Photo bomb <laughs> over there. Yeah. <laughs> no, he was actually the one taking the photo, so oh. <laughs> he just wanted to make that face. But you probably see some familiar faces there. You'll see yeah, June Tyson Gary. on the left, um, uh, and Gary Abood at the bottom, who are both uh, former Michigan Teachers of the Year. And then uh, we have some of my colleagues here from my district. And then um, just some people that I connected with uh, through this conference. So I, I realized through this year and this process that um, connecting educators is really going to be what's most powerful in their professional development. And the McCall Conference was a great culminating experience of what I've learned. So it was a great chance to meet with people who I've connected through Twitter um, and never met in person. And we already felt like we knew each other. So um, I know you mentioned Twitter earlier, Mike. and I commend you for using it because I have found it to be the, the single most powerful tool uh, in my professional development this year and in connecting um, with other educators across the state. So I would like to find ways for more teachers to be able to get involved. I know that there was one school district, and I want to say it was Romeo, that sent their entire staff to McCall this year. Um, and what an amazing, powerful experience that must have been for them. Uh, it was also a chance for me to reconnect with um, some other outstanding educators. I've been part of the Michigan Educator Voice Fellowship this year, um, and there were several of us there, so we got together for dinner. Um, so it was a, a, a re-energizing uh, time for us. And, you know, I should mention, too, about the Ed Voice Fellows, that they've been really, really big proponents of trying to um, help people understand the Common Core and the new Michigan standards so that they see them for the valuable things that they are and not the things that, you know, uh, Kathleen spoke about, what, you know, the misinformation that is out there. Um, some teachers from Mish Ed, which is, you know, just kind of a connection of people through Twitter, they put together something called an Idea Slam, and they invited educators, um, you know, who could buy a ticket for $20 and be part of this fun night, and they had people who submitted ideas that could, um, you know, promote teacher leadership, and they selected finalists. The finalists got to do a pitch while we were there, uh, a two-minute pitch, and um, then the audience got to vote. So you see this picture here on the right with everybody on their phones. Um, people were voting right through an app, or right through their uh, website, and then the winners were selected. And actually, the winners were part of the Voice Fellowship with me, and they would like to put together a teacher leadership summit for Michigan. Um, just as they're doing across the country. So it was just an exciting chance to see teachers who have very innovative ideas, um, who you know, want a chance to be um, given the means to develop that. And uh, there's also a teacher exchange program that's been used throughout Michigan that they'd like to implement in Oakland County. And uh, uh, some of the teachers that were part of that slam are working on putting that together. So just so many things that, so many great things that came out of McCall. Um, I also got to present, and my presentation topic was Think Like a Teacherpreneur. So that's a pretty new term to me, um, but it's one that I'm fascinated with. <laughs> and um, really, the core definition of teacherpreneur is being able to lead from a classroom. And that's something that I feel very strongly about, and I know so many other teachers who would like to do more um, by, but while staying connected to kids. So that's the whole idea about teacherpreneurship, and I want teachers to realize that there is this whole world of teacher leadership outside of their classroom that exists. And if they can get involved in Twitter and if they can get involved uh, in different conferences, then they become part of that and it makes them feel valuable and it uh, encourages them to do more and become even better. So I encourage teachers to have business cards. I encourage them to develop websites, not for their classrooms, while those are important and they should have those. Um, they should also have them for themselves to, to be able to share and promote what they are experts at and um, you know what they can bring value to. So I got some amazing response from that um, and many teachers who have um, begun that process of being teacherpreneurs. I got to spend the day at Lamphere High School and you know I'm an elementary uh, person so anytime I can see high school in action I find it fascinating and um, this was a great experience. They're doing some amazing things at Lamphere and I got connected to it because uh, a former Galileo uh, member 
uh, is a teacher there and invited me to see what they're up to. So I, I really, really enjoyed their um, audiovisual classes and they were developing some uh, really great TV programming that the students run themselves and develop and be able to share with the other students. I also really like this because it's, um, again, going back to that different classroom design. They got rid of all their chairs in certain classrooms and moved towards um, you know, research-based furniture. I got to attend and speak at the Michigan PTA conference, um, and so this is the president right here. And that was a nice chance to connect to parents and to be able to share with them the same messages that I've been sharing with teachers and educators um, and even sometimes policymakers across the state. Uh, one thing that really caught my interest when I was there was um, there was a representative from the Attorney General's office who shared information about the OK to Say program um, and just talked about this very easy and effective way for kids um, or really anyone to be able to submit confidential tips uh, about bullying uh, or about um, you know any problems that kids might be facing like suicide or things that they might be struggling with so that someone can intervene and help the situation. So of course that's something I'm very passionate <coughs> about and I'm excited to <coughs> board today. Uh, funny enough, I went right from the PTA conference in Lansing and drove to Grand Rapids for the Michigan Reading Association conference. So March is a big conference month. Um, and this was also my first time. And again, you know, as somebody who's been interested in learning and growing and wanting to be out there um, and, and learn from other teachers and experts, uh, I continue to be surprised at how many teachers have never been to these things. Um, but I think there's a lack of opportunity or a lack of understanding of how they can be able to participate in those while still being in a classroom. You know, so where does the funding come from? Where does the flexibility come from? You know, how do they get a substitute? So I would like to streamline those um, practices and make them uh, more visible and more transparent to teachers so that the people who really want to take part in these amazing experiences can um, and, and not to have to be in a specific role like I am to go. Um, but I got to see Jan Richardson, who's an expert in guided reading. I saw my little friend pause there. <laughs> and next year's Reading Association Conference will be in Detroit and is the 60th anniversary. So that was one way that they were promoting that. Um, one highlight for me was being able to see uh, Christopher Paul Curtis, who is the author of The Watsons Go to Birmingham. So I got to see him in person and they did an uh, interview with him and then we got to watch the film. Uh, which was an awesome experience as well. And then as my first time as an attendant, I was also a presenter. So I got to present um, on a reading instruction package that focuses on metacognition and reading comprehension skills for students. Um, I've done a lot of traveling. So the next week I was in um, St. Joseph, Michigan to attend the Andrews University uh, Teaching and Learning Conference. So that was um, mainly for their uh, teachers or student teachers that were preparing to be te teachers. And so that was another fun experience to be able to speak to um, you know, our future generation of teachers. And my message was very similar for them to be thinking about the idea of teacherpreneurship before they ever even step foot in a classroom. So that once they do, they'll be able to fulfill their um, you know professional development desires while still staying close to the classroom so we stop losing our strongest teachers. Diary of a Real Bully uh, continues to be on tour. So I've really enjoyed uh, doing several author visits throughout the state um, and being able to work with kids of all different age levels from kindergarten to middle school. <coughs> and um, actually, we're still continuing to be international because this is Marvin Temingadad. I'm saying that correctly, who is the State Teacher of the Year for Saipan in the Northern Mariana Islands. Um, and he is sharing that book with his students as well. So we continue to travel to many different places around the world with that message. Um, some other places I've done author visits are Great Oaks Elementary in Anchor Bay, William Ford Elementary in Dearborn, Dublin and Glengarry Elementaries in Wild Lake, and Leo Elementary in Middleville. And I have several scheduled in the next few weeks as well. So this is my favorite part of my presentation today. However, forgive me if I get a little emotional. Um, last month I mentioned that the University of Phoenix uh, awarded each teacher of the year with a Teaching It Forward scholarship to be able to pass on to someone in need. 
So this family here um, is the Nathan family. They're a family from my school, sorry. <laughs> um, you can see here that they have four beautiful daughters. And in the last month, um, the Nathan father was in an, a tragic accident where he was working on his car and the car fell um, on him and he's now um, in critical condition and um, things don't look well. So it was uh, amazing to be in the position to be able to reach out to this mom who is a single mother um, at this time and who has chosen to stay home with her uh, four children for, you know, for the last, um, you know, probably 15 years now because her daughter's in high school um, and is now faced with a future where she doesn't have any income um, and she doesn't have um, as much work experience that she'd like to be able to provide for her kids. So I'm honored to be able to um, award this full scholarship for an entire degree, which is worth $40,000, to this mother um, who would like to go into the home health care or nursing uh, field so that she can give back to the people who have taken such good care of her husband. Mm -hmm. So forgive me <laughs> as I tried to make it through that, um, but it's a thrill and an honor, and I know it's something she values and appreciates. So just yet one more amazing thing um, that being in this position has um, allowed me to do, so I'm grateful again. Thank you. Thank you, Melody. That's mm. really good. Good. Nice. Marty, now you have the task of following that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, Melody. Yeah. <laughs> now. You always bring tears to our eyes, too, Marty, but <laughs> for different reasons. So. Thank you. Well, I'll try to keep this brief because the legislature um, is just back this week for the first time since their since their break. Um, there are a couple meetings, um, committee meetings scheduled. One this morning, uh, the Senate Education Committee took up for testimony only the Senator Pavlo bill on educator effectiveness. Um, I'm not sure what the plan is as far as moving it, um, but they did take testimony. Um, it was split. Some support. Some. In opposition, and the House Education Committee meeting just uh, put out its agenda for Thursday, uh, nine o'clock. There are two bills: one that would um, allow for half credit of personal economics or financial literacy to account for the uh, economics credit in the Michigan Merit Curriculum, and the second one is the Senate uh, Senate Bill 139 Colbeck, which would allow for certain fundraising activities during school hours. So those. Those bills are up. Um, the legislative committee, this board's legislative committee meeting uh, on March 3rd, April 3rd, whatever, April 3rd, um, we discussed many things. <laughs> um, not so much bills because it was because they weren't really acting. But there are two statements that the that the committee members have developed, and I will throw it over to Cassandra for discussion and action. Uh, actually, thank you. Um, Kathleen or Lupe, would you like to introduce the first one since you guys drafted this? Can I introduce it? Okay. We all know that this resolution, the uh, proposal on the ballot on May 5th, just a <clears throat> short time from now, uh, was the road proposal. But the road proposal also includes funding for places, funding that would be taken away from the, under the gas tax that we now pay. The money is replaced and a little bit added for schools, for public education, which I think is very important to us. Uh, and I think that it, it's, uh, it's critical that we, I think it's incumbent upon us as an elected body, a state board of education, which is supportive of public education, to support this proposal, even though it's not 100% perfect, but nothing is. There are, there are things wrong with it, and it was, maybe it shouldn't have been done this way, but it is done this way. And uh, there's no alternative at the moment. Uh, the possibility of a better alternative seems practically zero to nothing. Minus zero. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
I, I would move that we support the following statement. And I second it. The State Board of Education supports Proposal 15-1. It would protect Michigan schools from severe cuts in revenue and provide needed stability for education. It also would help safeguard our families and children who depend on safe roads for transit to school. We believe passage of this proposal would provide significant benefit to our state. And I should say that this, this language came as a result of several drafts, uh, including, I think, the final wording from Eileen, which was very <laughs> helpful. Well, all I did was take everybody else's wording and just you tweaked it, which made it right. much better. It was very so, good wording. It was easy yes, to do so, that. So, thank you. And thank I you. second it again. So it was moved by Kathleen and supported by <laughs> Lupe. Any discussion? Thank you. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same? No. Nay. Maybe, I don't know, do we need to do a... I have six ayes and two nays. Okay. You're good with that? Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, I... I really appreciate this from the board because even when there's little differences right now I think it's just important to be on record and I would cite yesterday we talked about this at that alliance and I think it was just clicking in with some of the associations that it's not just about potentially the 300 million of new money it's potentially the drastic cuts that will come because there isn't a, another option at this mm -hmm. point but mm -hmm. right. but there's reason as you said that this is anything but perfect but it's um, I'm on a call every Monday to try to it's looking tough right now. No, it certainly looks tough. Well, yes, ma'am. We're surely working hard in my area. You led uh, that. You led for, that. Yes, we, we're going to canvas. Oh, we're done doing different things, but we'll see. Well, thank you. Now there's a second one. Uh, the second one is simply a statement, um, and we're we actually drafted the statement before we um, realized that the coalition was going to be here today yeah. so it's certainly timely that we have this um, and it's just a, a state simple <coughs> statement saying that we applaud the coalition uh, for the future of detroit school children for their hard work and dedication um, the board acknowledges the report and its recommendation and urges the governor and the legislature to give these recommendations full consideration is that a motion i move that we um, support the statement there is support uh, for discussion. Okay, go ahead. Second. I, I have a yes, friendly amendment. We throughout our discussion with the, the committee that came to speak to us, we everybody used commend. We commend you. We commend you, and, and I think commend sounds more powerful than applause. So I would like to That's offer that friendly me. amendment. And I would just say it was very helpful to have the folks come, and mm -hmm. I think. People heard pretty clearly. I trust the sentiments of the individual board members about their com commendation and encouragement of embracing the, the recommendations. So I think this statement, as amended, is uh, is good and one. If we all can agree on it, it's very helpful to put forward. I, I personally, yes, ma'am. I personally don't think it says anything. I mean, it's just saying thank you for working hard and look at it. I mean, I think with all of the work that went in, and a way to really respect the work that was done is to um, support some of the conclusions and the recommendations. I, it, it's um, so I mean, it's sort of a nice thing to say, but it, it, to me, it's it's not really instructive. It's just saying, I guess, please read it. Um, uh, so, I guess you know, one of the things, I, you know, I, you know, um, would encourage the governor to. Um, I would. To adopt um, uh, the recommendations put forward by, and I mean, maybe that's too difficult to get past here. Or maybe, maybe this is all we can do in this period of time. But I, I would at least like it to be revisited, where we look at the specific recommendations, since it's so new to us, and you know, give it some careful consideration. Lupe and John. I think you're right, but and we discussed that at the legislative meeting <clears throat> and we came to the conclusion that uh, if this document here is going to be looked at by all the different principles and it's going to be changed and tweeted and it's going to be gone over a lot so we cannot 
say, okay, do this, do that at this particular point. You're right. We cannot do anything, but we felt this because this document is not concrete and whole and this is going to be it. We don't know what's going to happen to this document. So we're, we're making a statement, so we go on record as we're supportive, we commend you, uh, you know, we, we hope for the best, and then maybe in the future we can make something more concrete. The only thing is that the, it's, it's, it's kind of crunch time. I'm sorry. Oh. John and then Kathleen. Sorry. Well, I'm, like you, I certainly support an, an even stronger statement that yeah. we embrace the report, support the bulk of the recommendations, and encourage the governor and legislature to do the same. Um, I appreciate whatever the committee discussion was that didn't get to as strong a statement but came to a unified statement of encouragement, basically, uh, for full attention to these recommendations. Yeah. If, if, if we felt after today's discussion we could make a stronger statement and we could make it together without um, a lot of uh, debate or disharmony or split vote, that would be, uh, certainly I'm for that. Uh, I think people heard, that's what I was trying to say, I think people heard loud and clear where we're coming from mm -hmm. as a set of individual board members and the statement becomes less important than what we just did uh, in my view, um, but I'm supportive of any strengthening that we want to do. I just also want to try to keep us together in uh, as much as possible. Right, right. And that's what we did. Right. I respect that. I don't know the time the state this was made of knowledge of what the report was. Right. Sorry. Well, Kathleen, I, yes, I was going to say I agree with <coughs> Michelle. Uh, I would like to see a stronger statement in support of the actual recommendations. Granted, other people are going to look at it, but we can look at it and say we support it. But, 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 but I, I don't know if we can get the support for that. But. I, I, can, I am fine with this statement, and I cannot go beyond this. We are a board for the entire state. We have not been part of their process. I have not, I, I don't agree with the, some of the things that they have proposed because they don't fit with what I know of the rest of the state or the finances. It doesn't mean that it may not happen, but I personally have no interest in going through their report and choosing things that I support and don't support. I really want it to go to the people who will have the final say on that, which mm -hmm. is the legislature and the governor, and to go through it and start trying to either dismantle it or, you know, say this is, these are the things we support 90 percent of it. I, I, I'm not in a position to be able to do that, so I'm fine with this. I mean, I'm that I can't I'm do. I mean, concurrence. Um, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I mean, the role of the board is not to wait for the legislature to make a decision on oversight of education. <clears throat> I think it takes leadership and making, taking a position or trying to take a position on what we think will work. And this is not just a Detroit um, plan. This is a plan in, that is for schools in deficit and communities in urban districts across the state um, to, to be a, a bullet point for that. Um, I, I, I don't want to, to just <coughs> say, well, it's really the legislature's role on education policy and not our role on education policy to make better education policy recommendations. I, I, I'm kind of I'm confused about that statement. But <clears throat> um, so I, I, I hear that, um, that some folks, at least some folks at the table, are willing to take a leadership position and try to um, be instructive on education policy as it applies to urban districts across the street based on these recommendations. I hear that others are not comfortable with that. Is that correct? Is that can I can I process this? Would it be? I'm thinking out loud, okay. Michelle. But would yeah, it be would it be possible to, for the sake of discussion, to move? to a vote on this and then consider a second motion and see if you can get support for a second motion, you would at least have, it sounds like, you would at least have in your hip pocket a statement of support uh, per this particular language, and then you right. may have majority support on something else. But I think that's a thought, I rather than trying to carve the one that you seem to know have consensus on it. I, I tend to agree with Michelle, as you know, uh, we should be providing some leadership. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a, a strengthened statement that could get support from all our colleagues uh, that isn't perhaps as strong as uh, 
you would like and I would like Michelle, but okay. is, str is stronger than this one. Right. Um, and uh, let me test that one recommendation would be um, we strengthen this by saying, and I heard people say this publicly, we commend the coalition, uh, the board embraces the report and its recommendations and urges the governor and legislature to give it thoughtful and full consideration. So I was thinking instead of acknowledge support, or is that too strong? I'm, I'm for that. I'm just looking for I language that. Um, John's wording would be helpful. Yeah, because mm -hmm. yeah. we are embracing the report. I heard most of us say yeah. that and its recommendation, and we really are urging the governor and legislature to not only pay attention, in my view, I think they should embrace it as well. Um, but I think that could strengthen it because acknowledge yeah. sounds like, oh, that was yeah. nice. Merit, or, right. Or, but embracing is, uh, is a stronger sentiment. I don't know, do we lose uh, any of uh, our colleagues? You could gain me by saying the board, <laughs> the board embraces the report and urges the governor and legislation to give these recommendations full consideration. I do not embrace its recommendations because I don't know all of them thoroughly and I don't understand all their implications. And as they said, within the, within the group, uh, the uh, consortium meeting, they had things they had to drop. So it's unreasonable, I think, for uh, to put us all in a position where we're embracing a report that I just got today. I've read uh, the synopsis, but not the report. And if you left that out, I'd be fine. Could people so, go with Eileen's? Uh, so it would read, the State Board of Education commends the Coalition for the Future of Detroit School Children for their hard work and dedication. The board embraces the report and urges the governor and legislature to give these recommendations full consideration. Give its recommendations. To, I'm sorry, what? Give its recommendations full to give consideration. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, I move that language. Okay. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. We have a motion on the floor, so okay, that's right. so what? Let's wait, vote on the motion. The it's a friendly amendment that amendment. I accept. Okay. Accept well, it's language? not a friendly amendment. That's a change of the whole thing. No, it's a friendly well, amendment. You started it with the first <laughs> word, so well, one word, not we're the whole thing. The, we're changing wording, three right? words. This is your wording now. Yes, we're changing okay. three words. <laughs> Applaud becomes commend. <laughs> acknowledges becomes embraces. I'm sorry, we're losing three words and its recommendations, and then we're changing these to its. There we go. Very efficient use of the language. <laughs> Are you comfortable with that? And that's, my, that's better. And it'll help us stick on schedule. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay, after we vote, I, I want to say something. Okay. okay. <coughs> so I'm going to move while I have a chance to Are get Are you this. okay with that? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Say aye, by the way. He and there was one abstention. So seven. Okay. Abstention. Yes, ma'am. What I want to say is that we had this um, language in our little hands for a few days, and how come nobody had come with all these beautiful words before? There was there was some discussion among some of us about mm -hmm. strengthening it. We were respecting the discussion you all had in the legislative committee. I think what we just discussed with the coalition members certainly changed or encouraged uh, perhaps more. <coughs> aggressive, um, supportive statement. So I think it's pretty straightforward yeah. what's changed. That's what we have a meeting for. Yeah. That's what we have. And doing this. <laughs> like, don't we discuss yeah. it. Do we, yeah. uh, couple things come out when you talk to each other. <laughs> well, we did talk yeah. to each other in the legislative committee. And well, we the appreciate. whole board is here now. Right. And, and okay. I have okay. a full-time okay. job. You know what I mean? I can't get to all of the legislative meetings. and I. I, I can't anyway, good work. Yes. Good work. Yes. This was but we had it in our hands for a few days. We could have changed it. We'll get, we'll but anyway, well, we'll I, I, I'm entitled to say what, yeah, how I feel, absolutely. too. This is better. That it's better. I mean, I, so we did it. That's good. Yeah, you, but I'm, well, that's okay. We're good. Thank you. Yeah, right. we're I very good. I think it's good. appropriate. You that's came to a good conclusion. Yeah. And yeah. getting yep. the heck off this item right now. So, yeah. can we, <laughs> <laughs> so what, let's see. Are we done then, Marty, with your? Yes. I'm sorry. Yes, we're not. They were talking a lot about the third grade retention bill that's coming up. Do you know any any way that they're sort of moving with that right now? Well, we've got no clue that the, the, that bill's moving. Oh, okay. Tim Kelly just said they're really pushing on it. They were not, or they so were. Some place, right. some place between that discussion and board comment is the fact that um, I was asked to make a presentation on, on NAEP. Um, you know that I served on the National Assessment Governing Board for eight years, 
and uh, uh, they were the charge. There's a third grade reading group that's meeting. That's a joint House and Senate. As, uh, Marty, you can help me out. I don't know who else is on it. That's those are the faces I recognize. Right, Seem to be legislative and a few outsiders. Right. So. Um, Paul Stemmer, who is the NAEP State Coordinator, um, and Vanessa, and I went over to uh, the meeting and made a brief presentation, and they are working their way through. Uh, the, uh, I urge all of you to uh, watch the House Education Committee meetings, if you can, uh, and look at the agenda. But Florida came up and presented, the uh, Foundation for Excellence in Education came up and presented two Thursdays ago to the House Education Committee, and then uh, I know that they also testified before the Reading Committee. So they're picking their way through other states, including probably Tennessee, where reading initiatives have made a huge difference in the progress of children, and they're trying to find uh, what could work legislatively for the state. This is um, important work because um, uh, we are not part of it, and uh, we're not taking that discussion up here. And so you at least want to be informed as to what the House is doing, uh, because they're very activist on this, as they have been in other areas. Okay. I, and I say that, I mean, we've, we've been doing our, yeah. the department's yeah. very active in this area, yes. but not on this. You know, this is a different initiative. So we want to keep track of what the legislature is thinking and doing and who they're hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Senator, Chair of Appropriations, who is here, been. Uh, okay. Hansen. Hansen. Yeah, Hansen. so we were just talking, oh. one of the, and he was saying, you know, he's being supportive of some of the funding proposals and funding that supports third grade reading, uh, which was good, and I was saying that's good, because we all, I think, support third grade reading if there's the real help that comes to deliver the goods, not just require it, so FYI. Mm -hmm. Let me let me say something about this. We, we can watch these things on, on uh, government TV. And for, for this board not to be watching House and Senate meetings when they're aired is an error on our part because they're, they're getting ahead of us on things that we would like to participate on. The department is fully engaged, but the board will not know what's, what's happening. And I, I think it's, I mean, there's no question in my mind that the department is doing everything they need to. They're telling us what they see, but the nuances of how the discussions go are really important for us, for the way that we think and talk. I well, think that's I, a good I, word. Nuances. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to do that, but I'm, yeah. you know, at work all day. Okay, but, but if someone could do a synopsis or something, that would be really helpful. What I don't know, Ben, Ben, can you watch those afterwards, or are they? Yes, online? I was about to say they're also online. You can stream them afterwards. They record okay. them and put a link up most of the time when they've been recorded, so that's possible to watch them later. Okay. After it's already. We could even, you know, Ben's been can great on this. I, I'm not. Yeah, no. that would be really helpful. Okay. Send the link out. Or do okay. a highlight reel. Like <laughs> ESPN, <laughs> big play. <laughs> All right. It can only be a couple minutes long, you know. Oh yeah. He sends us a link that that would be very helpful. Or if we know when they're televised. You know, when are they meeting? I don't know. Do they meet on Tuesdays at 10 o'clock? Uh -huh. Are they televised? Uh -huh. You have to go into House Government TV and register oh, okay. your email address, and then you get way too many notifications. <laughs> you erase two-thirds of them, or 90%, and then you get the education committees. You can just so register it, strictly for education. I didn't know that. So oh, okay. I think it would be great if you could do that. But in addition, Ben's been very attentive to this stuff. You've seen his reports are crisp, mm -hmm. and they get mm -hmm. and there's. Mm -hmm. From what you just said today, there's probably a little bit more we could add to that in, in terms of synopsis. I don't know about a highlight reel, but <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, we could do like the end of March Madness. We could just have a two-minute video with a tearjerker <laughs> song behind it or something. <laughs> yeah. uh, but short of that, you know, why don't we? We'll try to do that. Some of this is so quick. I mean, we didn't know till last night about the Ed Committee, and till then, and suddenly they got an Ed Committee this morning at 8:30. Um, so mm -hmm. that's that's why sometimes. Yeah. When we know, we'll let you know. Uh, and then we'll try be to be, we'll get the links for sure to Kathy's point. And occasionally there is something where we could say go to two minutes, you know, go to a certain minute on it or something like that. But I, I want to just acknowledge, I said it two different times, even when Ben was up roaming around and we're all waving at him, he's kind of roaming yeah, around the good. fountain up there tonight. But, for you know, Ben, the team there, Wendy, the Marty, <laughs> Caroline, they, they really work hard on this. I mean, you know, I, I these are new folks today, so I let it go. But 
just because a few of those chairs are new doesn't mean these relationships haven't existed with their predecessors. So they're building these with new chairs now, which is all appropriate. But they've worked their tails off on this, and, and you know, 80 meetings so far, and more to come, and a bunch of hearings, as you know. Well, I think the third grade reading has come a long way since the introduction of just holding them back. Right. Mm -hmm. They realize that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Right. So they Amanda Price is a, a much more realistic, key person. practical yeah. approach, which is encouraging. Amanda Price is a key person, and I happened to be next to her at a dinner a couple of weeks ago, and she's very thoughtful about this, and yeah. I think the more Seems we can help be. shape the supports being the main thing, it feels less, they right. feel less of a need to be draconian. Now, there's a couple of groups, you know, watching. They always watch religiously, so I know you're out there, Gary. But they uh, they feel pretty <laughs> they feel pretty strongly about this and and they have you know appropriate right to try to move this in their direction. But I think the supports are the key. You yes, know, a, a small request. I, they're new. I'm new, so I don't know who was who or, or what. Are they senators, legis uh, le or, or the house? I didn't know who was what. So if we could get a list of the people that were here sure, and what position they hold, yeah. I would be very appreciative. We'll put a picture there too, so oh. you can put you a, put name a and picture. A face. That would help. Yeah, this is all going to be visible for you. Well, this you is know. just the ones that <laughs> just the ones that showed up. We're mm -hmm. not going to the ones that didn't show up. We'll send you a picture, but there'll be a line through it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, I want the, na the names of the ones that didn't show up because no. those are my friends. <laughs> <laughs> no, in fairness, they. I mean. Many were polite and just couldn't make the time work, right. so it wasn't it's as if they were snubbing us. Or you. Oh. Yeah, but you know, with this <laughs> early intervention, <laughs> oh. we've, been wor yes, we've been working on early intervention in the department for a long time. We had Muglisi that, I forget what it stood for, but it was early intervention. And, years. And how effective it was. It was working with, with uh, local districts and intermediate districts for just to get started from the very beginning. Now we're talking early, they were talking about kindergarten. Now we're talking early childhood, which is even better. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, that, mm -hmm. that, but we've been pushing this early intervention for years. Right. Just so think of, you it's know. not like this is a new thing to us, but it's a new thing to them because they never thought of it before. And they're not aware that this has been going on for a long time. And, so. I, and I think you would attest, as I would, I've been around 40 years in this too, that they're having the discussions. I mean, that's a big breakthrough, just the fact yeah. that we're talking about these things, even with some of the disagreements. So to your point, it's we're at action time, we're finally. Mm -hmm. Right, there were a lot of people in the field who were very knowledgeable about this, yeah. been working on it for a long time. Yeah. So any comments from board members? Yes. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean all of that. Area of concern. Yes. And it's something that we've been concerned, the board as a whole has been concerned about for many years. Carolyn Curtin was a champion of it, and we said we would follow through for her. And now there's been such a horrendous uh, event that, ha that took place in Detroit regarding the two children who were found in the freezer and whose mother said they were being homeschooled. Mm -hmm. And people asked me about that. We're talking to people in the community. And they why don't we, did, why did we do something about it? I said, well, we don't know who's being homeschooled. What do you mean you don't know who's being homeschooled? I said, there's no requirement in the law that a homeschooled parents, that homeschooled children have to be registered any place. We don't know who is homeschooling and if they're homeschooling, if they're really doing it or if they're abusing the children. And it's been a concern of ours for a long time. And people in, in are now talking about, some people anyway, are now talking about maybe this would be a good time to review our homeschool policies, the lack of saying uh, the law re requires nothing. And I know it's been a hard sell to get it, even the legislature to even look at it. But it might be worthwhile. I know that we've got a lot of different things on our plate, but it might be worthwhile to put this on the agenda for some you know, not, not too distant future, but not a, not necessarily yeah. tomorrow. But yeah. uh, it's an issue that people people I've told this to are just absolutely astonished. I can't believe this. They said, "You don't know. Nobody knows." I said, "No, nobody has to know unless the parents voluntarily want their children to take music." or participate in sports or something, they don't have to tell anybody. So, I, mean, I remember Kathleen, was, a few years ago, 
this was one of those things where I asked Carolyn before she left the board, is there an issue you care about that you want us to pay some attention to in your last year on the board? And she said, homeschooling, yeah. we don't know what's going on. And we have you know, deliberate public policy that doesn't allow us to collect the basic information so that they can re-enter the school system in some organized way. My thought at the time, and we did a little bit of work into this, is given the anxiety on the homeschooler movement that somehow some of us are uh, trying to do something to be out to get them, that it would have to be uh, an effort that was like a committee led by Richard, who among us might be the one perceived to be not uh, someone who is an enemy of homeschooling, but someone who is sympathetic. So that was my only thought, was if we could have a, have a look at homeschooling that was somehow led by somebody who clearly is not unsympathetic to homeschooling or is not that out to get That would be very them. good. That would be really helpful. And Richard, yeah. I talked a little bit about this, and it's, it's a very awkward thing, but the, the, the real reflexive uh, um, fight back from the homeschool movement that we're somehow trying to police them anew is, is I, I realize that. I, I know, know that's, that, was, that, will, that will happen, but I think it's something that's worth discussing and yeah. raising the issue, maybe the, just in a sympathetic way, mm -hmm. oh, but in a protective way. But then think about the how children. we might uh, proceed in a way that would be right. defective, I guess. And oh, oh, what, what, what is the position of the department? We don't well, have a position, have nothing. Yeah. I mean, there's just no inherent authority okay. on that, but I guess in theory there could be. Well, and, and you all did pull together just the basic facts of the yeah. case, our homeschooling law policy is among the most um, limited in all, among all the states. We don't have information about how many and who and what learning program they have right. at all. So we're flying blind. Well, I just raise it to yeah. Yeah. people I think should it, be I think it was Richard, then I leaned about it. Michelle. Or maybe yours was a different topic. Mine was a different topic. Do so you want to finish this one? discussion okay on that? that? Sure. Okay. Michelle, I, just, I just wanted to say that the real tragedy with that is that there was no family member and no family friend yeah. who, in the community, um, who, uh, no neighbor, who, who stood up and said, where are those children? And it's, it's not, I mean, you know, the homeschooling issue I'm sympathetic to, but the real problem for me is the community aspect, which is devastating. Yeah. I, I think there was a teacher who did. It was reported yes. anyway that a teacher noticed and tried to um, uh, bring attention to it. And a teacher, but they a were teacher, the girl, or the, I guess the, the former girl, teacher, fourteen-year-old girl, and he was interviewed about, and then he was basically sort of brushed off, and nothing was done, and he had made but there are fathers more than just asking. But I, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So, so I, I have a question: Is the authority then is the parents that's they have the authority to send them to school, or send them to school, report or not report. It's their thing. It's not the government's well, thing. I, I it's think not. You correct me if I'm wrong. Mandatory. They to homeschool your child, you're supposed to deliver the same academic content right, that right. we require of all students. Right. There is nothing tied to that to tell, to know if, when, how that happens. We don't even they don't even have to register that they're homeschooling anyway. They can just sort of fall off the grid. Yeah. So it's the, the parents. The parents' authority choice. or mm -hmm. whatever yeah. that yeah. responsibility or you know they take that responsibility and, and I mean I know you mean it but it should be said obviously there are folks that take that very seriously and and, and mm -hmm. do a good mm -hmm. job and come yeah. to our high schools right. often that's a transition where they've done it for elementary and then come to high school very well prepared but I know we're talking about obviously the, the exceptions to that and how that might be mm -hmm. yeah. yes I am I, um, there's a couple of things I want to say. Um, one is that there's uh, Doreen Allen, and there was some legislation um, that was looking at absenteeism, trying to sort of make a universal understanding of what is absenteeism, and connect with it, doing research, you know, finding out why kids are not coming to school if they fall off the grid. And this was like a Moore Corrigan, and I mean, there was a, it was yeah. a, it was a bipartisan effort, and there was some legislation yeah. proposed. You want to help with that for a moment? Oh, well, that's, yeah. you know, there's been some transition with right. leadership with Judge Allen and now Justice I know, Mayor. yeah, Mary Beth. That kind of kind of taken over the program, <coughs> right. but they're still hopeful to get those bills reintroduced during the session. Right. Senator Pavlov, at least last session, committed to having additional hearings this session on those right. bills. So I'm wondering if there's any way, or if there's any 
way to amend or to look at those in terms of tracking at least kids who have been in school, like the kids in this case, and then all off the grid. I mean, I think it's important. Um, and then, you know, they're told homeschool, you know, they might be homeschooled, so we don't have any obligation to follow up. Um, there's some way to tweak the language or to address those issues more clearly in the proposed legislation. Maybe that's something to the legislative committee could ben, look at. Representative Chang has uh, approached Chang me about, about that legislation that was her district that, that occurred in. Tragedy. Okay. And uh, I, notif I let her know that Senator Shoemaker has been working on this legislation the last term okay. and planning on dropping the legislation again this term and that she should reach out to representative. <laughs> because I'm um, Senator Shoemaker because uh, she's more than willing to work on this issue bipartisan. <coughs> so Representative okay. Chang said that she would do so. Um, once the legislation has been dropped or introduced, then we'll be involved and we can actually take a look and see what what um, the language looks like. Okay. And we can move on from there. And of course, I'll let Representative Chang know that Senator Shoemaker introduced yeah. the legislation. No, no, Stephanie. And uh, if you have yeah. suggestions, of course, we can take those suggestions to the Senator and we work from there. The other thing I just wanted to, to mention, the second part is <clears throat> my personal experience with this when I had uh, foster kids, and I, forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but um, they were with me and they were still in the purview of the court. They brought them back to the family, but they still were under uh, court orders, um, uh, the family was. And the family was not <coughs> bringing any of the, there was nine children and not one of them were going to school. Matter of fact, one who I couldn't intervene and save. He's now 25 years old and he only finished sixth grade because his parents never took him back to school. But anyway, and he's really suffering now because he has a sixth grade education. Um, <clears throat> but the, uh, so when I was trying desperately and telling the, the family court and the guardian, guardian at litem, family court, even in foster care, when the family has, the, the referee said we don't do anything around att school attendance. And they completely pulled back. <coughs> not my, I don't, we're not here to judge parents based on whether they send their kids to school or not, which I thought was sort of mind boggling um, for the court that's supposed to be looking after the welfare of children. And, um, and then I also called the truancy office. You have to call the truancy officer. So I'm, I'm, I'm calling and calling the Detroit truancy officer, and I get um, somebody who's working the office, and she says, There's really nobody here to staff. We have no, it's like we have one person for the whole city and, and, and they're probably only homeschooling and she wouldn't even take my complaint. I had the address, I had information, I had all this. She refused to take my complaint and she said, they're, I'm sure they're just, oh, they're probably just homeschooling is what she said. And then I called the um, Wayne County Prosecutor's Office because they had some folks there that would prosecute parents. And I didn't want to go that route, I didn't, but I didn't know what else to do. And they threatened to prosecute parents and um, and I, the, the foster care agency wouldn't investigate I'm saying they're not in school oh no the parents said we are they are in school I'm like no they're not in school it's like, but it was just sort of this sort of benign neglect um, and sort of people don't want to deal with it for whatever political reasons and um, and it's not just in, in, in the schools it's in the, the justice system it's right. in the, you know, I, saw, I know I sent you all a link, but and I'm biased. I'm on the board and have been active for years. But the Children's Trust Fund is really an appropriate way to try to help get at this in the largest sense in every area where this is a problem because it's 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 certainly in the areas you're talking about and it's areas beyond. I was a new superintendent 25 years ago, and the biggest surprise to me was I kind of had a stereotypical view, maybe created by media or movies or TV, of <laughs> what an abusive parent might be like. And then you find out they're in every kind of situation, small numbers, thank God, but in every kind of situation one could imagine. Um, but, you know, the media projects, you know, certain things and you find out. So, so what I'm getting at is this, I have a lot of faith in them and, and their fundraising and other things being a way to um, try to look at the bigger picture on some of this stuff and not, uh, not unimportant are these issues, but that's just for your commend to you that's a way to also uh, participate and try to get change so not to belabor the subject but since it's brought up one of the things that we've also looked at is from an educator's point of view and in this case we're 
you had an educator that, you know, tried to follow through. And we've seen other incidents and very tragic incidents in Saginaw and, you know, elsewhere. But looking at um, secondary trauma for educators and those folks who, you know, work with children, and that's a huge issue. And I, I don't think that we do enough around that. that um, so um, thinking and considering how we can address that as well. That's a really good point. My daughter, her first year of teaching, I don't, I don't hope she wouldn't mind me saying this, but she, a young man committed suicide and she could not, uh, it was her first year and these were issues well beyond anything she was involved in. She had them one period a day in a high school class, but that, that feeling, first of all, you have, in general, you have very caring people that are in the profession to begin with. <coughs> so when you add to that, trauma is a good word. I hadn't quite thought about it that way, but it's, And Richard, you got a different topic, so we'll... Yes, I just wanted to report, having attended uh, March 21st and 24th, the Dansby Legislative Meeting. <coughs> Frankly, I was surprised that I didn't see Kathleen there, because I know you're a... Oh, no, it's the first one I've missed in all these regular. years. But uh, really enjoyed getting to know uh, uh, my colleague Pamela here and, uh, and Ben uh, as well. Uh, just uh, um, the... Uh, I found the presentations to be very helpful and talk a lot about the renewal of the uh, ESA and uh, had the opportunity to visit uh, my Congressman uh, Dillon's, uh, Dillon um, Dingle's uh, office and Senator Stabenow's with, uh, with Pam and I um, uh, appreciate uh, uh, the board making it possible for us to, uh, to attend this. I was, as I think I texted you, I was starting to get on the plane and literally got sick. Oh, and it's a good thing I didn't get on the plane. Oh, and, okay. and then that night they were texting me because they were ready to, in a very unkind way, roast me in the beginning, <laughs> just before <laughs> okay. Todd's presentation. So uh, dodged a bullet there. Yes, yeah, so okay. sorry you missed it, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Well, the, uh, we didn't mention it, but the, uh, the Senate Education Committee, Health Committee, Health, Education, Labor, Health. Yeah. <laughs> meeting today, taking testimony on their newly introduced bipartisan revisions, reauthorization of ESEA. It has some good things in it, yeah. I think, from yeah. our point, from the state's yes. point of view. Maybe some things we don't like, but uh, like everything else. As you said earlier. Which is a bipartisan, they, that they got together was really quite wonderful, I think. Yeah. So. We might we can make recommendations on what we think about it, so we should be paying attention to it. I sent you with the stuff I got from the, uh, or in S Maryland to, to send you the stuff I got from Nasby. Mm -hmm. Good. So any other thoughts? Then consider ourselves adjourned. Good meeting. Thank you all.